Okay. okay, can I call the regular meeting of Council to order for April 3rd, 2023? Approval of the agenda, Councilor mm -hmm. Julie. That the April 3rd, 2023 regular council meeting agenda be adopted as presented. Seconder. Councilor Noberry. All in favor? Carried. Adoption of the minutes for March 20th, 2023, regular meeting of council minutes. Recommendation. Councilor Noberry. That the March 20th, 2023, regular meeting of council minutes be adopted as presented. Seconder. Councilor Dussault. All in favor? Carried. Uh, March 27th, 2023, budget meeting of council minutes. Recommendation, please. Councilor Dussault. That the March 27th, 2023, budget meeting of council minutes be adopted as presented. Seconder. Councillor Julek, all in favor? Carried. Business arising from the minute, staff? Council? Okay. Delegations? Are they coming by Zoom? Okay, sorry, I didn't know that. I was waiting, so. Um, 6.1, food cycle science, request from Jacob Hanlon to appear before council to present about municipal food waste diversion program with the federal funding. Jacob, are you there? Oh, yes, I'm here. Perfect. Thank you very much for joining us. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. I'm just going to share my screen here. Sorry for the delay. I wasn't uh, wasn't sure if you were ready for me yet. Okay. Can you please conf Burn, you can see my screen okay? Yes. Yep, it sure is. Perfect, Perfect. thank you. Um, okay, well, I just want to start by uh, saying good evening, uh, Mayor, Councillors, and uh, members of staff. Thanks for having me on tonight. My name is Jacob Hanlon, and I am the Municipal Program Coordinator at Food Cycle Science. And I'm really excited to uh, be here tonight to discuss a food waste program opportunity for Tumblr Ridge. Uh, I'm going to go over a lot of information in a short amount of time here, so I just ask that you bear with me, and I'm happy to answer any questions at the end of the presentation. Perfect. So to quickly go over who we are, Food Cycle Science is a Canadian company based out of Ottawa, and we're 100% focused on food waste diversion solutions. We do this using our innovative technology called the Food Cycler, and it's an in-home food recycler that's sold direct to consumers through partners like Vitamix and Bur uh, it's in classrooms through partnerships with not-for-profit organizations. And we also provide these to municipalities through our municipal solutions division. So our municipal solutions help many small, rural, remote, and northern communities keep food waste out of their landfills. Uh, we're currently working with 73 Canadian municipalities across seven provinces and territories from Nelson uh, in British Columbia up to Hay River in the Northwest Territories. Uh, and then several communities throughout Alberta, Manitoba, and uh, Ontario and Quebec. And what a lot of these places have in common is that they struggle with food waste management or they aren't necessarily in a position to implement a green bin program. So the problem with food waste is that it is avoidable. It accounts for a large portion of our household waste, often a majority, and it's made up of mostly liquid, which is heavy and freezes in the wintertime. And then on top of that, when you put food waste in the landfill, it's responsible for generating harmful greenhouse gases. So all these factors make it so that food waste is a, a problem that has a strong municipal impact. So one of the impacts to municipalities is that since food waste makes up such a large portion of our waste stream, it's causing our landfills to fill up quickly. Now operating a landfill is costly for a municipality, so we want to extend the lifespan of these landfills for as long as possible. Uh, the environmental impact is that when organic waste is in a landfill and it's breaking down, it's producing methane gas, which is many times more harmful than CO2. So to put that into perspective, taking one ton of food waste out of the waste stream 
is the equivalent of taking one car off the road for an entire year. And then in our communities, putting food waste in the garbage causes a lot of odors, which are unpleasant for humans, obviously, but typically attractive for animals like bears and raccoons who like to go through our trash. So removing food waste from the garbage eliminates these issues and it reduces the overall volume. And this can save on hauling and disposal fees, save space in the landfill, and it can save residents on some hassle and on any excess waste fees that they might face. So we often get asked, how do you already? And there are green bins available, which are common in big cities with high population density and typically the right infrastructure. However, this could be cost prohibitive and often operationally challenging to implement. Many people in your community might backyard compost. And while we think this is a great solution, unfortunately, it's not feasible for everyone. Uh, it's certainly not a year round solution. And there's still the concern about bears and other animals being attracted to the waste in the compost bin. So then finally, the easiest solution is to continue landfilling organic waste, but the long-term impacts here are pretty costly and harmful to the environment. So I'll just speak while playing the short video here. What we've done at Food Cycler is proposed a different way to deal with our food waste, and it really focuses on making our food waste very easy to deal with and right in our homes. So essentially what we've done is built a small kitchen appliance about the size of a bread machine where you put in your food waste, and this can include fish, dairy, meat, poultry, even some bones. And then after pushing a button, after about a four to eight hour cycle, what you have is a dry, sterile, odorless, and nutrient-rich soil amendment that comes out. The machine can be used anywhere that has a plug. Most people keep it in their kitchen, their basement, or even in a heated garage. And the machines will process on average between one and three kilograms of food waste per cycle. Uh, as I mentioned, each cycle takes between four and eight hours to complete. And it uses between 0 0.8 to 1.5 kilowatt hours of power per cycle, which is about the equivalent to having a computer plugged in for the same amount of time. And then what you finish off with is about a handful of dry, sterile, and odorless soil amendment that can be used in gardening, in an existing composting system, can be given to a local farm or a community garden. And so our two solutions that we have available for our municipal programs are the FC30 and the Maestro, both of which uh, work in essentially the same way. They have a two and a half liter capacity bucket for the FC30 and the Maestro has a five liter bucket. We find that residents in our program sometimes prefer the larger bucket size in the unit uh, if they have a larger family or they have a lot of food waste. Uh, but each unit is roughly the same size in terms of countertop space. And with our programs, we often leave it up to the resident to choose which unit they would like. As I mentioned, they process kind of between one and three kilograms of food waste per cycle. Um, and with this soil amendment that comes out, as we'll look here in the next slide, it's a dry and completely inert biomass with many beneficial uses. And while the number one use is to use it at home where residents can be in charge of their food waste and see the process from start to finish and implement it into their garden, it can be added to a backyard composter as well. It could be integrated into an existing leaf and yard waste system. Um, it can be used at a local farm in some sort of a community pickup uh, and especially community gardens as well. Uh, it's very beneficial. So looking at some of the impacts here from an environmental standpoint, the food cycler is a net negative carbon solution. And what this means is that just like planting trees or using solar panels, uh, when you use the food cycler to avoid bringing food waste to a landfill, you're avoiding more greenhouse gases than you're creating in the process. So the same can't be said for many other municipal operations, such as waste facilities or waste and recycling collection services, which would rely on a large fleet of emitting vehicles. When we look at an economic impact, our solution offers a return on investment by significantly reducing your waste management costs. Typically, you're looking at savings of upwards of $100 to $150 per ton when you compare it to the traditional methods that involve hauling and disposal. Now, one thing we've learned from working with municipalities is that residents are very interested in being part of the solution. They want to try new things, they want options, and they want their government to bring these things to their community. With the food cycler, you get to bring something innovative and tangible to your residents, and they don't need to live in a big city to be able to divert the organics. 
So we believe that food waste diversion should be available to all Canadians, no matter where they live. And with the food cycler, uh, what we're doing is no, no pun intended, but we're focusing on that low hanging fruit as we like to call it, because since food waste accounts for such a large portion of our household waste, it's the single most impactful strategy to achieving any kind of diversion targets that you may have, or you may have coming in the future. Now, I mentioned earlier that we're working with several municipalities across Canada, and to date, we've completed pilot programs in over 40 municipalities and over 4,700 households. And what we found is the results have been overwhelmingly positive. We are able to achieve a significant amount of net new waste diversion. Uh, we've had a generous user experience rating of 4.6 out of 5 stars and a 98% participation rate from residents within these programs. Now, many municipalities have expanded their programs uh, to more households within the community after their initial pilot programs. And I'll use Nelson uh, in BC as an example. They did two successful pilot programs and they're now putting a food cycler in every home of about 5,000 households in their city. So just to briefly touch on some federal funding that we can put into these programs, several months ago, we were selected as a finalist in Impact Canada's Food Waste Reduction Challenge. And this is a three-part initiative from the Government of Canada to reduce Canada's food waste. As a finalist, we were awarded $400,000 and tasked with finding more Canadian municipalities as implementation partners. So what we're doing is using this funding to invest directly into these pilot programs at a heavily subsidized price. And these programs have been helping us move into the final stage, which comes with a $1.5 million grand prize, which will 100% be invested right back into these programs. And any municipalities that partner with us will have the right of first refusal on any subsequent funding. Now I'll just get into the pilot program timeline really briefly here. Uh, residents would purchase a food cycler at the subsidized rate from their municipality. They would use the unit and track the number of cycles per week. And then at the end of the 12 weeks, they had to keep their food cycler, fill out a brief survey so that we can evaluate the program success. And then we present these results back to you in a final report or a feasibility study uh, to help with any future waste management decision making uh, or accompany a grant recommendation. And then basically our funded pilots work like this. We have a initial retail price of each of our units and we subsidize this model down with our own discount. We then add in the federal funding, which reduces the price of each unit by 50%. We then ask the municipality to subsidize by $100 per household or per unit. And this allows the residents to have access to these solutions at the lowest price possible. And then after the 12 week pilot program, the unit is theirs to keep. We have a few pilot size recommendations here as my last slide before I wrap it up. Um, for a community such as Tumblr Ridge, we would recommend the 100 household pilot program uh, and with $100 subsidy from the, from the municipality per household, this would be a municipal investment of $10,000 uh, plus the cost of shipping and, uh, and tax as well. But I'll highlight that these are they're just merely recommendations based on our experience and we're happy to tailor this program uh, to fit your needs and to fit your budget. So with all that being said, uh, I'd just like to finish off by saying we'd like to welcome Tumblr Ridge as partners in this food waste reduction challenge as we do believe your community would be a great fit. Uh, today, we ask that you receive our presentation as information and if there is interest in partnering uh, we you know, on a funded pilot program, we'd ask that you uh, refer to staff for report and recommendation, but I believe there may be a report that's already been brought in. Um, so for now, I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have. And thanks again for uh, for sitting through this and, and allowing me to present to you tonight. Well, thank you very much for <clears throat> for coming in or, and Zooming in, I guess, and filling us in on this. I think it's a uh, great thing um, for myself anyways. I think it's it's phenomenal for our residents. The only question I would have is when we talk about 100 units, are we allowed to split those 50-50 between the two different units? Yeah. Yep, so it, it can actually be split in, in any amount to your liking. Uh, what we often do is a pre-registration where residents uh, will, before we do any kind of shipment or agree upon the split residents, will sign up for the program and pick their units so then we can actually send the exact amount that they want. Uh, but sometimes we also do a 50-50 or 60-40, uh, whatever the municipality prefers. Okay, perfect. Thank you for that. Council Nobre. Thank you, Mayor Kakaka. Thank you, um, Jacob, for presenting. It's um, a very exciting thing, um, what you're doing. 
My question is, I have two questions. First off, is there a smell during the process of um, that four to six hour cycle? Uh, no, there's no smell. So each unit has carbon filters in them, which are basically charcoal pellets that cycle the air throughout and uh, these filter out any smells. This might lead to another question, but the filters usually last between about three and six months, depending how heavy the usage is. Uh, we are happy to either uh, work with the municipality to have fil uh, filter refills, uh, let's say in a municipal office, or we also have our own online portal where residents can order fil filter refills for themselves. Thank you. Um, my question wouldn't be actually isn't about the filters; it's about the unit itself. Do you know how long it lasts? Like, is this are they built to last three to five years, five plus? Do you know? Yes. Yep. So. Our FC30, the smaller unit, is built to last about five to seven years, and the Maestro, the larger unit, is about seven to ten. Uh, we have yet to have a uh, an end of life uh, with any of them at this point. Uh, typically, any manufacturing defect defects uh, are seen quite early on, and each unit comes with a one-year standard warranty. So. We deal with that side of things. If residents ever have any issues with their unit within the first year, uh, we, we replace it for them. Thank you. Councillor Julik. Hi, I'm happy about this as well. I'm really happy you could join us and that our staff uh, brought it to our attention because this is a really cool program. My question has to do with, um, you've recommended uh, 100 households. If council wanted to do more than that, um, <clears throat> would the subsidy still be the same? Yeah, so that's a good question. So this pricing, we would honour this moving forward. Um, if you wanted to start with 100, let's say, and there's a sign up and there's a surge and there's 200 and you wanted to add another 100, uh, basically moving forward from the signing of uh, or a council resolution or the signing of a proposal, this is the pricing that we honour moving forward, whether it is a small top up of another 50 units or it's a, a bigger expansion. Thank you. Okay, Thank any you. more questions from council? Councillor Hoffman. Thank you, Mayor, and I appreciate the presentation. A uh, couple of questions, because I know I'm going to get asked by them. Uh, right now, what do those filters cost, roughly? So each filter ref yeah, it's roughly $20 for a filter refill. Okay, and uh, how noisy is the unit? Uh, no noisier than a dishwasher. Okay. And I thought I had a third thing, but I can't think of it, so we'll stop there. Okay, thank you. Councillor Dusso. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, yeah, thank you, uh, Jacob, for coming in and doing this presentation. It was really awesome. Um, I look so forward to this. I think this is a really great idea, um, reducing our waste within, within our municipality. So um, I really, really look forward to this. So thank you very much. Thank you. Any more questions from Council? Councillor Hoffman. I remembered. I remembered. Um, <laughs> most of the pictures are uh, vegetable and other fruit and that sort of thing. Is there any issue with carbs or proteins being uh, recycled in this way? Nope. So it can, uh, it can process basically every food. It has a, a do's and don'ts in, in the manual that comes with it, but essentially up to bones you can put in and with the smaller unit you can even do small chicken wing bones fish bones the bigger units can handle a bit more sizable bones um, things like pineapple uh, skin corn husks would, would need to be cut up very small before going in uh, but most foods it can handle including the the foods that you wouldn't typically put in your backyard composter let's say such as meat and, and dairy and, and carbs Good. thank you Thanks. Okay, any more questions from council? All right, well, thank you very much, Jacob. And you did mention it um, further on in our agenda tonight is a report from uh, from staff. So we'll be discussing it again then. So Fantastic. thank you very much thank for your you time. Thank you very much. Thank you, I really appreciate it and have a great rest of your night. You as well. Okay, 6.2 Northern BC Tourism Association. A request from Clint Fraser and April Moy, CAO and, De uh, and Destination Development Manager respectively to appear before council to present the provincial and regional tourism framework, noting areas of work and partnership activities with Tumblr Ridge. Welcome, Clinton April. Good evening. Can everyone hear me? We can. Oh. Awesome. All right, well, thanks for uh, 
Thanks for having us this evening, folks. Um, I do have a uh, presentation deck if I'm able to share that. Sorry, one sec. Fantastic. Uh, can everybody see that? We sure can. Awesome. All right. Well, uh, good evening again. Thanks for uh, thanks for having us uh, tonight to uh, have a, a discussion about some of the tourism activities that are happening uh, across northern British Columbia. I only caught the very end of that setup, so I apologize if that was uh, if that was already mentioned. Uh, also, just want to acknowledge that April Moy from our team is uh, is on the line as well, um, and also. Uh, you know, I'm gonna I'm gonna go through the presentation. I believe we have about 30 minutes, and uh, I'll try to quickly get through that um, and leave at least, you know, 10 minutes for a bit of a discussion or a question and answer sort of period, if uh, if that's appropriate with everybody. You bet. So we start with 15, and after 15 minutes, we'll put a motion on the floor to see if it continues. Oh, okay, perfect. Well, I'll go even quicker then. Um, all right. Well, uh, tonight I am joining you uh, from the unceded traditional territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and tsleil tooth Nations here in, in Vancouver for meetings. So I'm really honoured to be uh, presenting tonight from their traditional territory. Um, and uh, just want to say I, I'm sure that uh, Therese and, and Manda are in the room tonight and uh, I believe Tony Fayette as well. So it was really good uh, to, to see them at the industry conference that we were very proud to host in Northern British Columbia and Prince George uh, a few weeks ago. And I uh, certainly appreciate the partnerships and ongoing work that we continue to have uh, with Tumblr Ridge and, and certainly the uh, uh, those particular individuals who help champion it within the uh, within the community. Um, and I also uh, want to welcome any council members that uh, are in attendance tonight to uh, come to next year's Northern BC Tourism Summit, which will be in Prince George in the fall. Um, and uh, always uh, exciting to get that back online after a number of years uh, offline due to the uh, to the pandemic. First, I uh, just want to start off uh, by talking a little bit about the Northern BC Tourism Association. I'm sure some of uh, the people in attendance tonight might be less familiar with it. Um, Northern BC Tourism is a regional destination management organization working sustainably to enhance the tourism industry across the region through destination development programming uh, and essentially marketing uh, activities. When we talk about the tourism sector in uh, Canada or the tourism ecosystem, um, this slide just references how it all works together. It's definitely not rocket science. We have a national organization um, that represents tourism interests uh, in Destination Canada. We have provincial uh, tourism organizations across the provinces. Um, of Canada in, in BC, we know that as Destination British Columbia under the super natural British Columbia brand. Um, a part, obviously, a big part of that is uh, Destination BC is a Crown Corp, so they work with the Ministry of Tourism uh, very closely. Uh, there are also five regional destination management organizations uh, that work in the province of BC, uh, of which we are one. We'll get more into that in a second. Um, many local uh, community destination management marketing organizations, um, and we also work very closely with uh, dis regional districts uh, and other local uh, governments. But none of this happens without the big red dot in the middle, which is the tourism operators and experiences, the people with skin in the game, and the people who uh, offer those great experiences to our to our visitors. 
A uh, small but mighty team here. Uh, certainly, uh, you probably recognize some of these individuals. We deploy a decentralized model. Northern BC is big. We'll get into that in a second. But we have a team that works basically as home throughout the throughout the region. Our our main bricks and mortar office is here in uh, in Prince George, but we have uh, people working out of uh, Smithers, out of Fort St. John and uh, April works uh, out of Langley. So here it is, uh, tourism in the North is an economic force. I always love this slide because for many, they, they don't actually sometimes realize the impact uh, that tour, tourism has in Northern British Columbia. It's definitely not the highest profile industry uh, that we have up here. Uh, but generates about $1.2 billion annually um, in revenue. And you can see there, there's a domestic U.S. and international breakdown. Um, the big dark green spot, including Haida Gwaii uh, out there on the West Coast, is the region that our team particularly focuses on. Um, and we are one of the, This is this will come as no surprise to anybody in the room, we are one of the least uh, densely populated uh, places in North America, and uh, certainly our land base and wilderness is the uh, component to our leisure tourism mix. So, um, you know, I think uh, many of you probably live in Tumblr Ridge for that exact reason, so I don't have to spend too much time on that slide. Uh, like I said, nonprofit association governed by an independent uh, board of directors. Most of these directors are business owners and people with skin in the game or um, other uh, community or public entities. Quickly, um, you know, obviously it's been a tough go for, for the tourism sector um, over the past couple of years when people can't move. Um, that's the definition of the tourism industry. And so obviously COVID has had major impacts. Uh, first hit, tourism is the first hit. Um, you know, uh, the hardest hit and will be the last to recover. However, uh, we're moving into, uh, you know, a new era of tourism and we're seeing uh, demand for travel bounce back much quickly than what we anticipated when we were in the depths of the pandemic. So um, it's really quite encouraging to see that. When we look around at some of those indicators, you know, we're seeing um, on the West Coast, just a couple of examples here, but we're seeing on the West Coast, uh, you know, cruise ships come back on online um, and not just come back online, actually come up back online in a way that is uh, much higher and much more impactful than we've seen in, in previous years. Some of our, our smaller events, which were, you know, um, significantly impacted are also coming back online. Uh, so you see here, Chetwin International uh, Chainsaw Carving Championships. It's great to see these small community events that are important to our sector uh, making their making their way back. Um, you know, even though there's optimism in the sector as we rebuild from the pandemic, this is certainly not unique to tourism. But we are definitely facing many, still many uncertainties and uh, challenges. A uh, big one is, uh, you know, around uh, impacts of uh, labor shortage. Uh, we see these types of signs up in many different tourism and hospitality businesses uh, around the region. And um, certainly it's, it's you know, definitely uh, creating some challenges. We've seen impacts, you know, to the supply chain, just like every other sector, um, causing disruption to business operations and uh, certainly to the to the visitor experience. Uh, inflation is obviously a challenge. We're seeing uh, fuel prices on the rise, uh, Russia's invasion on the Ukraine. You know, all of these things that are uh, that are on our radar in terms of how our sector, you know, comes comes out of the pandemic. So we're keeping our eye on those. In tonight's presentation, uh, I'll focus on particularly three things, destination stewardship, market awareness and industry development. I think those are really, you know, critical pieces, uh, certainly for our organization, but for the um, for the sector in general. Uh, so we'll just start with with destination stewardship. Um, you know, over the past several years, uh, we've continued our efforts to further develop and set meaningful destination stewardship priorities. 
Um, you know, and, and, you know, what does that mean at the core of our work? It's really to, you know, the desire for industry to disperse the benefits that tourism can provide, uh, across the region in a way that supports further development of livable communities, certainly looking at, at the enhancement of, uh, resident quality of life. We want to make sure that this work is sustainable and we're going as far as saying that, you know, we're trying as, as best we can to align with the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals as that's, you know, never been import, more important as we move down that path. And, you know, we talked about some of the challenges. We talked about the pandemic, um, but certainly, you know, the, the um, opportunity on the other side of the pandemic is that it's given us this ability to rethink over the long term, how we rebuild a viable and sustainable industry here in northern BC. And, you know, certainly when we look at boom bust economies, um, you know, which many northern BC communities are, uh, you know, we're seeing mill closures, forest sector impacts, you know, all those types of things, um, you know, that the tourism sector is a, a viable and relatively sustainable sector if it's enhanced and developed in the right way. And I know most of you folks in Tumblr Ridge are, uh, you know, the, the community is a really good example over the 20 years that I've been working here and, and April as well in terms of recognizing that and, um, you know, certainly uh, advancing your uh, tourism as a part of your um, uh, work in the community. And, you know, not all communities in northern BC are, are doing that. So certainly uh, from our perspective, a, a commendable uh, approach over the long term uh, development. Um, a big part of destination stewardship evolves around sustainability, like I mentioned. Um, so Northern BC Tourism is working on strategies that are related to supporting sustainable tourism. Um, in July of 2022, we joined our other uh, regional destination management counterparts across the province and became one of 35 certified biosphere destinations globally. Um, you know, which really supports our efforts in championing sustainable business practice uh, with our industry and and really ensuring the long term viability of, of tourism in northern BC. So we're very proud of that. And we're working every day to not only maintain, but advance uh, components of that work um, and and uh, working very uh, diligently to support uh, businesses and communities who also want to uh, you know, adhere and adopt uh, similar uh, work. So very uh, proud of that. Want to skip also, uh, you know, as we're as we're running quickly through this to destination development. So um, we equate this, everybody understands destination marketing in terms of attracting visitors here. Um, the destination development side is really the supply side and and working to make sure that we have the products and experiences that are that are in the region uh, when when visitors uh, when visitors come. Um, so in order to do this, we've developed uh, two destination development frameworks, uh, one in northeast BC and one in northwest BC. Just want to acknowledge that I believe a few of you in the room uh, have have participated in that work, and we're certainly appreciative of that. Um, but it took a number of years to get these in place, and and we're proud to uh, report that you know they're they're together functioning. And the reason we refer to them as frameworks is because they're living, breathing, ongoing, evolving documents that set a bit of a foundation for how to develop tourism across the region. And you'll see here just some of the themes that emerge from these plans. And again, um, probably not a lot of surprises here, but environmental integrity, um, looking at our infrastructure, access, our amenities, how important collaboration is, particularly in our big region, um, how we develop our experiences, uh, um, acknowledgement of the tourism workforce and the development of that, and then working with our government partners to ensure that, you know, we have the support that's needed. Uh, lots of work going on in this file in terms of, um, you know, uh, investment. So uh, we were fortunate enough coming out of COVID to get a $2.3 million, uh, what we refer to as the TRTD fund, uh, which has really helped in actioning uh, some of these strategies. Um, 
and just clicking through quickly. Here's some of the projects so far that we're that we're working on. Uh, I won't I won't obviously read through all those. I think you recognize the picture up in the top right. Uh, very proud of the fact that we're able to support and contribute to uh, you know the pump track in in Tumblr Ridge. And again, commend the people that were involved in putting that together. Such an, uh, a fantastic uh, new product for. Uh, both residents and visitors in that community and really, you know, adding to that, uh, not only the visitor economy, but enhancing resident quality of of life. So um, happy to do that. I also just wanted to quickly um, just reference in terms of this funding, some of the some of the components of Tumblr Ridge has been engaged or in, involved in just so everyone has an understanding. But um, I'll get into our thematic framework in a minute, but certainly we we had um, uh, a, a bunch of individuals in the community come together in November to help provide feedback and and uh, you know some commentary to help support that. Um, uh, another note on the signage master plan that I'll also talk about in a minute. Uh, Council has approved iconic primary and pillar signage to be placed at the Tumblr Ridge Visitor Center, which is really important and helpful to the work we're doing. So I want to thank you for that. I talked about the pump track, um, doing lots of work in accessibility under this under this uh, funding, um, uh, including a project where we install uh, toilets and picnic tables and benches at trail infrastructure. and. I believe that uh, there was a component of that invested in uh, in Tumblr Ridge as well. Um, so just, you know, needless to say, lots of work going on across the north, but certainly in Tumblr Ridge under under this particular fund, we're really happy to be partnering with uh, with uh, some of the champions in that community to make uh, this stuff breathe some life into this. In light of time, I'll skip some of these things. Um, just yeah, just get, if you just give me one second, there, Clint. I'm going to put a motion on the floor to continue the presentation for 15 minutes. Seconder, Councillor Julik. All in favor? Opposed? Carried. Go ahead, Clint. Thank you so much. Um, so uh, definitely tonight wanted to uh, April and I wanted to make sure that we got in in front of council. Um, to certainly talk about a uh, TRTD project uh, that is, uh, well, two two planning documents in particular. Um, one we refer to as a thematic framework and the other we refer to as the master signage plan. They're both highly linked, um, but we were very happy um, that in uh, October we were able to um, get endorsement on both of these pieces of work and essentially the uh, thematic framework is a, a bold attempt at uh, assisting in um, putting together themes, regional themes uh, from around uh, Northern British Columbia into a succinct document that helps uh, tell the story of Northern BC and many areas within Northern BC. So lots of research put into that. And the hope is that, again, we can continue to evolve this, but many communities, uh, and Tumblr Ridge would be a good example of a community that does a really good job, but there are many communities who are, are missing opportunities to kind of, you know, look at telling more about their community, telling stories, creating narrative that that generate interest um, and and local resident uh, community pride of place. And so this document is really foundational in in helping sort of uh, inspire or initiate some of that conversation and a and a you know, a plan to help move some of that ahead. And then in direct relation, I think we all know living up in Northern BC, signage is always, um, you know, uh, can be challenging and and there's uh, much needed upgrades and in infrastructure uh, in terms of signage, wayfinding, uh, and particularly interpretive signage. So there's all these opportunities um, to do that. And we were able to put together a, a master signage plan that, you know, again, serves as a as a foundation for different areas that that might be interested in in uh, developing, you know, a local signage plan for their community. They have something to link into or something to reference in terms of uh, regionally how we're we're putting all this together. Um, we also uh, on the development side have been really um, fortunate to work um, with a partnership. Um, up in up in northeastern British Columbia, Northern Rockies Regional Municipality, 
Um, also with Public Works uh, Government Service Canada, District of Taylor, uh, District of Hudson's Hope, and we're able to work with them to start punching in, you know, rest stops and and putting in washrooms. And uh, our component of that was, you know, being able to to start installing and putting up some putting the signage master plan into place and and doing some interpretive signage. Uh, you know, at each of those locations. So we continue to work on that project and we're very, very proud of that. I mentioned accessibility. It's really important. Obviously, it's a big part of, um, you know, making sure that we're inclusive of, of you know, the experiences that we offer. And so there's a lot of work going on um, in terms of uh, in terms of that piece. And I know that um, we've, we've worked with uh, Tumblr Ridge in some capacity to also um, profile some of the accessibility uh, experiences uh, through some of our through some of our marketing activities. Um, April, do you have anything to add to that? Sorry. I can move okay. on. Okay. Apologies, I lost my cursor for a moment. No, um, I think that regarding the accessibility, we um, had the opportunity to, uh, we were committed to developing two itineraries and um, ended up uh, developing a Northeast Winter Experience itinerary and came into Tumblr Ridge with uh, Brian Peach and our crew, as well as, uh, and um, uh, and Trez and uh, Jesse and also uh, Zena and uh, Jenna really helped out with putting all those uh, details together. And we managed to stop in at the curling, uh, the curling and visitor center and also the dinosaur discovery gallery. So that'll be, uh, and of course, whenever we do anything like that, all of that um, material is always available to all of our partners. So we look forward to sharing that with you in the future. Great. Um, Again, just in terms of time, I might kind of quickly run through a couple of these other slides. Um, travel trade continues to be obviously an effective way at, at bringing in uh, and opening up new markets. Um, I, I won't spend much time on that tonight, but certainly invite anyone who has questions about working with travel trade uh, to connect with our team and our office. On the Indigenous tourism side, uh, certainly an important aspect, uh, probably the the fastest growing sector in terms of uh, demand, um, but also in terms of interest from Indigenous partners and communities in developing pro products and looking at economic diversification. So, you know, working very closely with ITBC and, and the communities on developing um, those experiences. I'll skip the... Uh, the value piece for a moment. Um, and then uh, finally, um, the marketing side of things continues to be an important aspect, you know, for, for industry. Uh, we obviously need to generate effective marketing tactics to uh, attract key markets to the, to the region. Uh, we do that primarily uh, with our partners through develop, creating and developing uh, inspirational and appropriate uh, content for distribution to qualified audiences. The content really is developed and it could be written, it could be photo based and it could be um, video based, um, but really around these, uh, which again is no surprise to anyone in the room around these particular um, components. I would invite anybody who's interested in acting uh, accessing any of these assets to to visit the BC Content Hub because everything that we shoot is available up there for for uh, you to use. Um, also, continue our work uh, to to uh, attract travel media to the region to cover our to cover our products. So, you know, when you're sitting in that dentist's office and you're flipping through the Canadian Geographic, um, you know, and thinking, "Wow, this is really cool that the." you know, museum is featured or the UNESCO Geo Park. Um, you know, a lot of that has to do with partnerships of the local champions in the community working with with our teams to to pitch editors and journalists and and all that kind of stuff. So it's a very effective uh, marketing channel. Um, and we, you know, every year continue to get really good media traction in a bunch of different publications, online influencers that you see here on the on the screen. Also very active in campaign uh, marketing with with partners across the region, and uh, you know in this case visit Northeast BC and Tumblr Ridge. You know is obviously a a partner 
in uh, these digital campaigns that we help to uh, to support in partnership with with uh, those entities. And then the last piece, um, obviously working on uh, continuing to um, develop our industry and offering opportunities to access research, uh, which is critical. Some of you probably receive uh, regular updates from myself and our team, um, you know, making sure that we're, we're visible and that you, you have the information at hand to make some of the, you know, really important decisions that you guys make around the, around the council table. Um, and just really looking as always to support business in whatever capacity they need. And, uh, you know, that could be in a number of different ways, um, from, from marketing to, to finance, to, you know, um, advice on insurance and things like that. So looking to always try to make sure that we're that, that credible source, because up in Northern BC, we know that, uh, it's, it's very much needed and it's a big part of our strategy to continue to, to do that. And, uh, so far so good, uh, industry seems to be, you know, uh, really, uh, gravitating and, and picking up on, on a lot of these different programs. So, um, you know, with that, I think I will, um, open it up to any discussion or questions, um, that the council might have tonight. And, uh, certainly, you know, wanted to thank, uh, thank all of you for allowing us the time to give you a super high level flyover update of sort of the happenings in the industry in, in Northern British Columbia, Northeastern British Columbia and, um, you know, Tumblr Ridge and, and, uh, you know, again, I just want to reiterate that, you know, Tumblr Ridge, I've, I've been with the association for almost 20 years and it's been really, uh, quite cool to see, uh, such a great community like Tum Tumblr Ridge, um, really take a long-term approach to the, to the development of the sector, which is, which is very strategic and very needed. Um, you know, obviously commend the work of the UNESCO Global Geopark. It's one of the core iconic features that I think uh, certainly we um, grapple onto in terms of Northern British Columbia, but it's, it's you know, more than that. It's a unique place in the world, and we're very fortunate to, to be working with the partners that, you know, bring that to life and make that happen. And so I just wanted to uh, make sure that uh, I, you know, mention that because it's really... Uh, an awesome uh experience and there's so much potential in in that community and just commend the the work that you're doing so with that i will open it up to any discussion well thank you very much for uh zooming in you and april giving us an update and everything else uh Councilor julik hi both of you it's Good to see, even though it's up there on the screen. Um, I just wanted to say I know uh, our business, Wild River Adventure Tours, would not be uh, where we are today uh, without Northern BC Tourism's help. The Game of Thrones, for example, I've just been doing some work on that. You know, if I didn't know that I could just pick up the phone and, and phone Clint or April and say, hey, I don't know what to do next because I can only give you high-level information. Clint already, anyways, I won't go into that a whole bunch, but I know um, I've taken advantage of this last program about the marketing and stuff and those programs are amazing and um, I feel like we would not be where we are in northern BC if we didn't have your organization there and it's really cool to work with April because she's you know she spent a lot of time here and and she was a really big part of of uh, the big organizations here in Tumblr Ridge, making a go of things, always there with some advice and stuff. So I just wanted to throw kudos out there. I I don't think you guys get enough of those, um, but I know my experience within tourism would be a whole lot different without you guys. So thanks very much and for all that you do here for us in Tumblr Ridge. Thanks, Roxanne. No kidding, thank you for that. Any questions from council? Well, you must have given all the information because nobody has any questions. But yeah, I want to thank you guys for, for joining. But I mean, uh, Councillor Julix already mentioned it. I mean, I know you guys have been involved a lot within our community with the UNESCO Global Geopark, our museum, and we appreciate that. So thank you guys very much for joining us tonight. Thanks. Have a good night, everyone. You as well. Consent agenda, recommendation. Councillor Julik. That all items in the April 3rd, 2023 consent agenda be moved for information. Seconder. Councillor Noxena. All in favor? Carried. Are there any items Council wants to bring forward? Councillor Noxena. 7.3. Seconder. 
Councilor Noberry. All in favor? Garrett, Councilor Noxena. I know this has been a conference that prior to the pandemic had been ongoing for a number of years. And um, do I need to make a motion or do we want to discuss first? I would like to make a motion that we um, we sponsor the dinner that Dr. Helm has asked for. Uh, before I get a second, they'll confer a five thousand dollar donation. Yeah. To support the Tumbler Ridge Medical Conference to the amount of five thousand dollars. Seconder, Council Norbury. Discussion, Council Norbury. Thank you, Mayor Kalka. Thank you, uh, Councillor Noxana, for making the motion. As um, I, I support this conference. Um, <clears throat> I think it's a great opportunity for us to bring in professionals into our community and showcase our community. And in situations like this, I find it's gr um, we have an opportunity to plant the seed in people's minds of what Tumblr Ridge and what we have to offer. And I'd, I just think this is an opportunity for us to, to get the word out there in the medical, medical industry that um, we're a great place to come. And uh, yeah, thanks. Thanks, Councilor Norbury. Yeah, I feel the same way. I think this is uh, something that we've supported in the past, and I think it's great to, to be out there. And Councilor Norbury's already mentioned a lot of it, but we get a, you know you get a chance to, to show what Tumbridge has to offer for these medical uh, professionals, and, and in, to me, that's what we're that's one of our tasks. So, uh, fully support the motion, Councilor Clickash. Yes, I was at the meeting, and um, I I found out that uh, even nurses can be invited to this. Uh, conference and I think it's a worthwhile thing for uh, for everybody because uh, we need nurses right now so maybe somebody will decide to stay here yep, fully. maybe you should uh, do something to initiate that maybe some sort of uh, monies that uh, could be given to help them come up uh, young nurses come up here and have a look around and see what uh, they think of the of the place and maybe they'll settle here. Yep, fully agree. So I believe Northern Health does uh, does do that part of it. If there's a nurse that's interested, they do um, pay for them to come up for a site visit. And then usually if, if that happens, council click ash, usually council gets together and takes them for dinner. Um, if there's somebody that comes up looking for that position. So um, if you're looking for this exact, um, if the task force wants to bring some information back to council in regards to some nurses that are interested and having difficulty making it here, Council can debate then if that's something the task force wants to bring forward. Councillor Noxena. I'd like to echo what Councillor Clickash said that this really puts our community's best foot forward for any, for nurses, for doctors, for anyone who's coming in. It's just a great way to get people to come here and see how awesome we are because it's pretty easy to show that off when you're here. I agree. Okay, call the question. All in favor? Opposed? Carried. Anything else council wants to bring forward? Councillor Julik? Uh, 7.2. Seconder. Councillor Dussault, all in favor? Carried. Go ahead, Councillor Julik. Um, I just wanted to clarify that um, in the risk, it says uh, 15, the comma's in the wrong spot, so I wanted to confirm the 150 or 15,000. And the other thing I was concerned about was the confidentiality. I feel like this request for proposal has been brought to us, but it's been brought in the open. And on page 45 down in confidentiality, I'm a little worried that we've already violated that. Ms. Torval. Thank you. Um, I hadn't noticed that. It came in kind of late and we wanted to get it. Uh, it was addressed to mayor and council, so I just wanted to get it on your agenda. And whether we're going to negotiate or not is, is something that would be left up for council to decide, but this is for more for your information. And there was a deadline of uh, April 6th that they wanted to know by, so it's uh, kind of under the wire. Follow up, Councillor Julek. Um, so, uh, you know, it's hard to give them an answer if I don't know what that dollar amount is. So um, I'm, I'm going to guess that it's supposed to be 15000 but it could be just a misplacement of a comma. I'm not sure. So I would be, I wouldn't want to make a motion without the actual numbers in front of us. Ms. Torval? 
Thank you. For Council's clarity, it is 15000 Okay, and just some clarity back in regards to when we talk confidentiality and, and Councilor Julie mentioned it, it's on page 45. Is this something that we should go into close before we start discussing it? We could. Well, it just, it states what their confidentiality ask is. So I think if, if Council wants to discuss, I think we move into close at the end of the meeting here, um, just to follow what they've asked for. Councilor Hoffman? I think we need a basis for it to go to confidentiality though. Is this fall with under our, con our basis, not theirs? I would think this it's, it's a, and I agree with you. That, that's why I'm asking for staff's input. I mean, they put it in front of us. If there's a reasoning that it can be an open, it's their ask. Now, maybe it's because it's in regards to negotiating. And that's, and that's just fine. I mean, I'm not prepared to go to close if this isn't discussing one of our, our basis. It's not an employee question or any of the other ones that we've closed before. So that's where I'm at. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Ms. Torval? Thanks, staff. Just going through it. I'm just going through it. Could go into closed under uh, negotiations affecting the municipality. Okay. If you wish, if council wishes. Well, I think like, I think Councillor Hoffman's the same way as I am. That's why I've asked that question. Like, <clears throat> I understand there's 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 three reasons we can go into to close. I mean, they're asking for it. I mean, to me, I believe this would be in negotiations with. Yeah, like, I believe it's Dawes Creek, so it's municipal and municipal. Mm -hmm. Council Julek? Uh, to play it safe, um, I would like to say that we defer this to a closed meeting after our regular meeting. Okay. Seconder? Councillor Roxana, discussion? Okay, call the question all in favor? Opposed? Motion's carried. Okay, we'll leave that one on. Mayor. Yep. One Councilor uh, Nobre. Thank you. Just as a, for clarity, if we're adding an agenda item to a different <clears throat> agenda, do not do we not need unanimous support? It's not going to be added to a different agenda. It's already in our agenda. Just we're moving it to a closed. Don't need anonymous consent. It's already on our agenda. If we're adding something to the agenda that's something new, it's it's actually already on our agenda. Uh, Mr. Orville? Sorry. <laughs> so you would need to uh, unanimously agree to go into a closed meeting? Okay, then it's defeated. Okay, then I'm prepared to talk about it in open. I'd like to know what the legals are that. Okay. Staff can give us our, the, the district's opinion on that. Like I'm prepared, it's right here in my open agenda. I think we were trying to protect the district, but we have one against. So I'm more than comfortable to, explain, to, to talk about it in the open since it's my open agenda. <clears throat> but from staff side, I'd like to know how you'd like us to handle it. Okay. Well, we can, uh, I wouldn't feel comfortable doing negotiations at this point. It was uh, an information that came forward, uh, addressed to mayor and council. So we put it on the agenda. Didn't, it was uh, something that um, a previous year they have asked us, requested from us before. And so I don't recall it going into close at that time either. So okay. going into an open. Good enough for me. Does anybody want to discuss the uh, proposal by Council Julek? I would then like to, um, I've read it over and I would be comfortable um, making a motion. I can give my information why I'm comfortable before. No, if you do a motion first, please. Do a motion that we support um, the U18 hockey championships by with the fee of fifteen thousand dollars plus GST to the city of Dawson Creek. Seconder. Councillor Kletkash. Discussion. Councillor Julek. Um, I remember when the and I don't remember. I think it was U17 for uh, hockey. I don't remember if it was before COVID. Mayor Kukalka might remember. I thought that it, um, well, myself, I didn't attend. From what I could tell, the excitement within the community was very high. I think that we have a fairly supportive uh, hockey 
community here in Tumbler Ridge. I thought it was a really good opportunity for our kids, uh, for our community, and um, we have the facilities, so as long as it wasn't in conflict for anything else that was within our community at the time. Um, while the price seems a little high to me, I'm not really knowledgeable <laughs> about what that all entails. I still feel like um, this is something for our residents, and uh, I think it's good to take advantage of those opportunities when we get them. Thank you. I'll support the motion on the floor. I think it's it, it's great for our community. It's great for our residents, <clears throat> but but visitors as well. Um, Mr. Orwell, you're good. Okay. Um, I know I read through it as well. I think we can give some more information. I think I'd be careful what I'll say in this open, in regards to some of the information that we can um, approach or or ask for certain teams. And I think that's an opportunity that we should probably um, discuss in the next closed. I think that's kind of why they're asking for some confidentiality there. Um, it's probably not 100% approved by Hockey Canada yet. Um, this is a request, but I 100% support that. Uh, when we had the Russians um, up here, they were up here for uh, training um, to the pre-tournament. And I think it was great for the community. I mean, they were around our community. They went into stores around our community. They signed stuff for our youth and our children. I, I think it was, it was a job well done by the district and by our residents. Um, so 100% support the uh, motion on the floor that Councillor Tulik put on there. Councillor Noxana. I am not in favor of the motion as it stands. I think when you read through the list of the things the district needs to provide, that ups our $15,000 bill a lot. Um, if you look at 75 pre and post game meals that have to be approved by Hockey Canada high performance standard, uh, we need to cover some sponsorship signs or get them approved. I don't know what that means for our in-ice advertising that we um, have displayed and then the money goes to our local nonprofits. There's a very, very, very big list of things that we would need to do and I would want a price tag first before I can support this. Yeah, and, and, and the thing is, this isn't a guarantee of a game, so I understand all that. So I'm trying to be careful what, what we talk in regards to until we can get it into a closed, in regards to all the negotiations. As to me, it's it's we are um, they're looking for it to be enclosed because we're looking at negotiating between two communities, which is government. Um, but yeah, so some of this, but I mean, some of it can also be um, received back. So I understand your your, your questions in regards to advertising and all that. We've actually had games here previously and there was no concerns with our advertising inside our rink that we have today. And that was from Hockey Canada. Councillor Hoffman. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I'd like to second uh, Councillor Noxana's uh, objections. Um, I think that's just really it. It's not a 15,000 price tag and I think I would be more than happy to say that I support the concept but not as written. And if at this point, if we're going to say we support the concept and we want to go to negotiations, then I'm, I'm fine with doing that behind closed doors. But I think at the very least, we should have discussed the, that we're, we're planning on doing this on the outside. So I'm fine with where we're at. I'm fine with the concept of going forward, but I'm not fine with saying yes to what's in front of us. Councilor Julek. So the motion's only uh, allowing for the $15,000 fee. And I think like uh, Mayor Kakauka has said, the rest of it will be negotiated out. So all we're committing ourselves to here at this point is the $15,000 fee. Councillor Hoffman, oops, sorry. I, I guess I'm not clear on what what is actually being asked of us right now. So if they have an April 6th deadline, as all they're asking, a, is an in or out conceptually, or they want a commitment for 15000 by three days from now? Um, I'll go back to staff, but I think they're just looking that we want to move forward um, by the deadline date of, of April 6th, and there's some other information in there in regards to when payments would be due and stuff. So I think they're just looking that, yes, we're interested, and then, and then having staff move forward on it. Ms. Torville? Okay, well, fine. Yes, that is correct. Okay, thank you. I've got Councillor Noxan and then Councillor Julek. So the way I read this was the district of T Tumbler Ridge will. They're not asking us what we want to do. They're telling us what we will do. They want a dentist. Yes. Yeah. They want doctors on call. I think that we need to be very careful before we commit to even agreeing to the 15000 We need to be willing to provide the entire list of things. This is what they're asking for. Councillor Julek. And I understand what you're saying. I think what I, what my point is, is at this point, 
we're authorizing $15,000. That's it. That we're interested and we will do the $15,000. That would be my thought. Staff will go back to the city of Dawson Creek and say, because we didn't have clarity on a lot of the things, council is willing to do the $15,000 and needs clarity on the other items. I would not want to miss the opportunity to have this event come and continue to spotlight our community and our facilities and uh, maybe maybe connect some of those kids who need to get into minor hockey. So I'm comfortable with the $15,000 with staff getting back to the city of Dawson Creek. I feel like we have good relationships with our municipalities around us. I don't think they're gonna say, well, you said you do the $15,000 and you're gonna have to do this. We're not signing anything. We're just saying, yeah, we'll cover the first portion of the 15,000 because we wanna be in. But if we look at this and it's another 15,000, I'd probably still support it, but <laughs> I understand. Uh, Councillor Noxana and Hoffman's concerns, I'm still comfortable with this motion. Yeah, so so just my thought on the motion would be that the 15K is put to the side and the staff will reach out and come back. <clears throat> the 15K wouldn't be spent until council agrees upon, upon the contract. Um, that's how I read it. Um, I'm not interested in just giving 15K to Doss Creek and then, oh, no, none of this works for us, but keep our money. It's not what I'm interested in. It's 15K to bring a t game to Tumbler Ridge. And to me, um, we need to get other details and have a discussion in regards to, you know, certain things that were mentioned that they're asking. Um, so to be honest, that's not, ho that's not Doss Creek. That would be a, under Hockey Canada. But there is, um, staff has legs that they can go and, and do some legwork on it and bring it back to council. So to me, this is not spending the 15K, this is putting the 15K to the side so that we have it, if we can meet the, meet the criteria. That's my opinion of this. And if I'm wrong, Councilor Julik, please tell me, because I'd have a different vote. Councilor Hoffman, then Councilor Nobury. Thank you, and if staff agrees with that interpretation, then I'm, I'm fine with it. I have, to my mind, it's a negotiation of good faith and I saw the due date for the balances and that sort of stuff and all that I'm fine with. It's just there are a few clauses that I, I'm not sure we could actually meet even if we wanted to. So that's that's why I would want to have that uh, reserved. And as Mayor Krakowka said, I don't want to give them 15000 because we said yes today and it didn't work out. So just before I go back to staff clarity, so I know we talked about the dentist and stuff, and I'll be honest, last the previous time we had a game here, they were fine with an on-call dentist in, in Doss Creek. An emerged dentist, so. Uh, but just back to staff, just to get clarity on, I know what the motion says, but we're not spending 15K till staff goes through this, but we just want clarity as council. That's right. That we, the, the motion was that we support the under 18 hockey championships to this, and to pay the $15,000 to the city of Dawson Creek. Okay. But would that be paid before we get through all this? Yeah, thank no. you. Council Norbury. Thank you, Mayor Kakaka. So hearing everyone's thoughts, my, my thoughts are, I think it's important for us to bring next level hockey to our community. Looking back to when the, the Russians came, it was, it was a big thing. It was a big, big thing. And our exposure to that level of hockey in Tumblr Ridge is limited. And I'd like to see that happen for our youth to encourage them and their development. And this is what can happen because this is National championships. This is exciting stuff. So um, I'm, I'm, in, in favor of supporting the the event coming to Tumble Ridge. Yep. Any more discussion? Okay. Call the question on the motion. All in favor? Opposed. Motion's carried. Uh, new business recreation pass benefit policy admin 52 for adoption report dated April 3rd 2023 from the deputy corporate officer seeking the adoption of the recreation pass benefit policy admin 52. Um, I would suggest before we uh, make this motion I know when we had it at the PMP there was um, some things were added and then some things were to be left as the previous and then I see that in front of us um, we have some of the stuff that was to be not on our policy. Um, I don't know if staff is willing to talk about it, but one of the things we talked about, and that was, really, I mean, I remember it, and, and unless council wants to put a different motion on the floor, <clears throat> but one of the things was is we were not adding the immediate family members to BC Emmets for golf passes or the Tumbler Ridge Fire Association for their immediate family members in regards to golf passes. Um, that motion was never read at the PMP. And there was clarity asked the staff about it would not, obviously that meant they, that they would not receive it. Um, so just maybe clarity from staff if maybe this needs to be sent back or if we can make the changes on the fly here. Ms. Torval. 
so we can uh, make the ch make the changes on sorry one second sorry councillor knocks my apologies i'm going to declare conflict this policy list search and rescue and my husband's the president my apologies you mentioned that earlier Sorry to cut you off, Ms. Torval. So there is, sorry, Council, there is a um, resolution tracking page on page 57 of your agenda. At the December 12th policies and priorities committee meeting. Um, went through, council went through who would receive, which groups would be receiving what with regard to the passes and, and who would be uh, receiving them. So this was taken from the resolutions that were made at that uh, meeting for December 12th. And as you know, it's been back and forth quite a number of times, so it's uh, this tracking, resolution track was to kind of uh, let council know what was decided at the different meetings and whatnot. So if council would like to go through and do the, do the changes on the fly, that's fine. Or if you would like us to uh, bring back just one copy with everything, rather than showing you all the changes that were made and decisions that were made, that, that's entirely up to you. Okay, so so I'll just talk about page 55. I know we never made a motion in regards to adding BC uh, ambulance for, for golf and their families, immediate families, as well as the fire department. That motion was never read. Okay, so. So number four on the chart, on page uh, 57, there was a resolution that we add family to all groups on the VIP access passes and golf memberships, excluding family members of mayor and council. Council I have a different on page 59 uh, so that's resulting from the policy and priorities committee March 13th it says uh, family members and then in the discussion it says um, it should separate all the VIP all access pass from the golf membership pass the VIP access to members and family members and the golf membership just for the volunteers so golf membership just for the volunteers because giving away the golf membership to many people would impact the activity operation for the golf players so that was that was on March 13th in that meeting that we said that the VIP golf memberships would only be for members. And I'm content while I've got the mic, I'm content to uh, make the motion to um, adjust those two items within our policy before we approve the policy. If that's comfortable for like if we just make the motions on the fly, I'm comfortable to do that in this meeting so that. Uh, yeah, just, yeah, just hang on a second before we make the motion again. Um, if staff can produce the PMP notes from that meeting, I understand the minutes are taken here, but there's two different motions at the PMP. One was read and one was not read. And the one for the fire department that was not read. Because I asked about that and that's why I'm just looking for clarity for when we get this information in front of us. And I understand it's gone back and forth for four months. So this isn't staffing. I just want to make sure we capture it when it comes to other ones and how, how we capture it. I understand it's great to see the minutes in that, but when a motion doesn't get read to proceed with it, to me, it's it's a it's a dead at the PMP. But you go ahead with the motion, Council Julik. Uh, huh? We hit the buttons at the same time. Go. All right, I would like to make a motion that we adjust the um, recreation pass benefit policy admin fifty two to remove uh, VIP golf memberships from uh, B BC ambulance that it does not include and their immediate family members as well as D for the Tumbler Ridge Firefighters Association and remove and their immediate family membership. 
or immediate family members. Seconder. Councillor Hoffman, discussion. Okay, call the question. All in favor? Opposed? Motion's carried. Councillor Noberry. Oh, sorry that you had your pen up. I seen your number. No, I was, I was, yeah, my apologies. So, just curious if uh, Councillor Julik. I was just going to make a motion to um, ex, I don't to receive as presented for adoption. It'd be or as it'd be as amended. She's still in conflict. She's in conflict still. Oh, yep. So, yeah. So just before as we do, amended. is there any other um, concerns with the policy in front of council? Just before we do the, yep. then mm -hmm. we don't do friendly amendments. Okay. Council Julie, go ahead. That council receives the recreation pass benefit policy admin 52 as amended for adoption. Seconder. Council do so. Discussion. Councilor Julik, thanks. Um, I I think this policy is awesome. Um, I'm still super uncomfortable with mayor and council, so I will be voting against my own motion, um, unless somebody tells me I'm not allowed, but I'm pretty sure I am. Um, just for all the reasons that I've had before, I'm not gonna reiterate them, um, but that will be the only reason I'm voting against it. I, uh, I appreciate all the other organizations that get that. I just still feel that mayor and council are overstepping in their, in their acceptance of it. Appreciate your comments. Um, I'll support the motion on the floor. And one thing I will mention to council, I know staff is planning at the PMP, I believe, to bring the remuneration policy back forward to make sure it's added in there. <clears throat> and I think there just needs to be some clarity in regards to how it shows up on the SOFI. Maybe we need to add a line that, you know, it's on our, I know for, for sure it's on my T4 from the previous year. The previous year before that, it was not. Um, but it was something that was caught through finance and realized it. So then it was added as a taxable benefit. So now I'm not sure if it will show up in the SOFI when it comes up, but um, the uh, remuneration policy has already been asked from staff to be brought forward to make sure this is added. Just wanna make sure council knew that. Okay, any more discussion? Okay, call the question all in favor. Opposed? Motion carries. If we can grab uh, Council Knox on it, please. Okay, moving on to purchase of policy, um, TR1 adoption. Report dated April 3rd, 2023 from Director of Productive Services. Fire Chief seeking the adoption of the purchasing policy, TR1. Recommendation, please. Councilor Julik. That council adopts the District of Tumblr Ridge purchasing policy, TR1, as amended. Seconder. Councilor Dussault. Discussion. Councilor Julik. I just wanted to mention while I'm not, um, I thought it was very thorough and I'll be honest, I didn't read it word for word because there is a lot of stuff there. <laughs> so I'm, I'm really glad we have senior staff that knows how to navigate all that. My only concern, and, and I haven't had the opportunity to go through the bylaw, there is a bylaw in there that hasn't been looked at since 2011. And so I wonder if, um, and it is the bylaw to provide the appointment of municipal officers. It's bylaw number 582. So I'm gonna take a look at it, but I, I am concerned when we are looking at some of these things that, um, and particularly as it talks about uh, being uh, within the community charter, I don't know how often that changes as well. So, um, but beyond that, I thought uh, there was some good work there. And, and again, I'm really glad that I'm not having to navigate the policy. So <laughs> thanks for all your hard work. Ms. Torville. Just in regards to the bylaw and, and the charter, any comments from staff? Not at this time. Okay. But we could certainly look into it further if you wish. Okay. Councilor Noxana. I had a question for council, mayor and council. In 5.7, we are looking at best value. Would we like to weight local vendors into here? So look at companies owned by residents of Tumblr Ridge when they submit proposals. 
differently than out of town? Just giving our residents a step up. Is that something we're allowed to do? Is that something we want to do? Yeah, so so I know, and I'm, I'm not sure where policy is, but staff may be able to talk to it. I believe locally is allowed to be 10% higher on a quote, but um, maybe just staff clarity on that. It's something I'm, I have recollection because we talked about the same thing previously. Ms. Torvo? Thank you, Mayor and Council. I do know that in previous policies that was the case, and I will ask Chief Curry if he can provide further um, input on that particular piece. Sorry. Your Worship and Council. <clears throat> so, uh, and specifically relating to tenders and opening and, and bids, there is a local component that is actually made up in the rubric that provides a, a benefit to local components. Uh, depending on if we're talking about a service or a goods, it can be weighted a little bit differently as per whatever document that we're talking about at the time. And there is that threshold, uh, that 10% that's there, so that there is first come to, or not first come, first serve, but a uh, preferential treatment given to local. Thank you. Councillor Hoffman. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I think this is a great document to have available to all staff. The only thing that I don't know if it should be included with this or separate is, is, is there a change order policy in town that would be related to this once the bid's complete and if something is changing, do we have even just a form like the last few pages here or something like to deal with it? Ms. Torval? Thank you. I believe the change order component is part of the contract whenever there is a, okay. a contract awarded, but I can confirm with Chief Curry is that it, if that is the case. So is their process? It's the vendor's process, okay. It's done by the vendor. Thank you. Councillor Julik. I just wanted to say in regards to Councillor Noxana on page 12 of the policy, uh, there is a Tumblr Ridge clause that's, that has to be um, added to all of them. Well, the first one is, is that Tumblr Ridge is committed to the utilization of local suppliers and that has to be put on uh, all supplied documents. So it's page 73 of our package and page 12 of the policy. So I appreciate that staff keeps that in mind as well. Okay, any more discussion? Okay, call the question, all in favor? Carried. 8.33, Food Cycler, Food Waste Diversion Municipal Pilot Program. Report dated April 3rd, 2023 from the Director of Economic Development and Tourism regarding Food Cycler, Food Waste Diversion Municipal Pilot Program. Councilor Oberg. Thank you, Mayor Kukok. I'm going to move into a uh, recommendation that Council direct staff to progress with the Food Cycler Municipal Program Pilot Program for 100 households. Seconder. I'll second that. Discussion. Councillor Noxano. This is a really exciting project for our community. I don't know if anyone has a backyard compost. It is not super successful in Tumblr Ridge. You do sometimes get animals coming in. Um, and we just have a really short, warm season. So this is a great way to divert waste. I loved the guy that came on and told us that you can mix and match if you need a bigger bin or a smaller bin. So we'll absolutely support the motion on the floor. Councillor Julik. Um, I, I love the program as well. And I wonder, and, and this pertains to the question that I asked um, Jacob um, about it being more than the 50 to 100 uh, households, um, because if we had more people look interested in that, like I like the idea of the pre-registration, but I also, um, I'd be interested in if we could have a few here, because as we all know, unless you offer food, generally <laughs> we, don't, <laughs> we don't always catch everybody's attention about what's going on. And so I wonder if after that, like, and I'd, I don't have a problem with a second order, but I feel like as I read through some of the proposals and the costs of shipping those, if we wanted to have a few extra. So my, my, my only concern with the motion is that it limits us. Um, I wonder if we could put a dollar value on that rather than a unit number. I don't know if that would be uh, good idea through staff, but um, that's my only concern. I think that it's pretty cool. I appreciate Miss Finnegan bringing in her unit so we could actually get a look at them. Uh, there was nothing in this that I was hesitant about after hearing the presentation. 
Yeah, and I guess just my thoughts. I mean, my, my assumption is when we talk 100, I would think we're going to do pre-registration even for the 100 so that we hit 200. We're ordering at one time. I mean, um, you know, maybe we don't put an amount uh, amount there or something. Maybe we change that, amend that a bit, that it as, as per 100 or as per our pre-order. I mean, that way, if, if the community does support it highly, and there's 200 that we're only ordering at one time, and obviously it'll help with our shipping. So maybe we could amend that a bit. I'm not sure what council thinks, but you know, <clears throat> they project 100, but then like you said, if you do the pre-ordering, and he actually recommended that, if we get 150, then we know that we need to order at least 150. But um, he already canceled himself. Council, you so. Um, yeah, I just want to reiterate what everybody else is saying about this program. It's, I think it's really great. And my only question is, is when can I get one? <laughs> As soon as this go, if this goes through, I'd imagine you can get on the pre-order list when when staff sets it up. Um, Councillor Hoffman. Thank you, Mayor. And Councillor Dussault, my wife's joining you on that list the second this becomes available. Um, I'd just like to point out the title. This is pilot program. There's nothing to stop us from ordering another 100 next year or have an open program or however we want to do this. Um, I am gung-ho. I think this is a great idea and I think it'll work, but I don't know. I think we are going to need to have some feedback on did we have less waste actually going through the town on whether this is a good value for the town. And I would still be open to even subsidizing to a degree, but I think we should know that this is actually worth it for the town. And uh, I think 100 is reasonable. If we want to just go with what pre-registration is, that's fine too, but I think that we're trying this. And if it's successful, then we might even want to go to the point where we recommend it. And I wouldn't say require, because you could just leave it at a as a hunk on your uh, on your kitchen. But I am very hopeful. If it is 300 kilograms-ish per household, I think we should see it in the transfer fees uh, uh, changing. And we should get that feedback before we go gung-ho and order 500. So. I'm good with the 100 that was proposed. Um, if we want to do a pre-registration for up to 200, I'm even fine with approving that now if you guys want to do that. But I think, just remember, it's a pilot program. Let's see the results at the end of this. Yeah, just before I go to this, to staff, so I, uh, you know, again, it's on page 37 of our agenda, but they talk about the pilot program, participants for the unit period of 12 weeks, and they have to fill out a form. So they're actually getting that information back to this organization. And the other thing I like what, what they said in regards to that is first rate to refuse if they get higher grant. We, we could end up, you know, third shipment or fourth shift and seeing a bigger um, piece on the rebate because we got first rate to refuse that order. So that's one thing I like about it. Um, Ms. Torville? Thank you, uh, Mayor, and through the Council. I know with your Let's Talk coming up on April 19th, so I'm just wondering if you, if Council feels that this would be a uh, value to have a demo or some promotional material at that Let's Talk meeting on the 19th? So. I wrote Let's Talk right beside my question, <laughs> right, right beside it, so you're on it. Um, yeah, I, I would 100% think that we should have it at Let's Talk. Uh, I'm not sure what Council thinks. Uh, Council Nobre. Thank you, Mayor Kakalka. So we were on the discussion previously about us upping our number. And I think it's appropriate to do that just so that we can have one less level of administrative burden, so to speak. So if we get like 100 people register and there's 20 more people that want to do it or 150, 100, like maybe there could be, I don't know. That we'd have to come back and sit down, do we want to do that? At this point in time, I would say yes. So rather than, you know, bring this back, I think we should open it up to 200 and they're going to bill us afterwards. We're not putting out 20,000 bucks um, right away. They're going to invoice us for how many people register and they're going to ship it all at the same time is what I'm reading here. So I would be in favor, I'm going to make the motion that we expand the um, number from 100 to 200 households. What, what about the amendment just saying in regards to the pre-application number? So if it's 150. That's what they would order instead of putting a number of 200 there. So all I'm saying is people come in and they can sign up, right? Yep. So maybe we, we use that. It's whatever the acquisition of, of sign up is. And then, you know, maybe plus 20 or plus 10. And then that way staff has extra. But that, that's all I'm looking at. I mean, so I amended. <laughs> so whatever, whatever the pre-registration amount is. Can we, can we say that? Plus 10%. Yeah. So pre-registration amount plus 10%. That's the amendment. Yeah. Yep. 
Here we go. Original motion is that council directs staff to progress with the food cycler municipal pilot program for 100 households taken directly from the agenda. And the amendment to the agenda would be to expand that to pre-registration amounts plus 10%. Second on the amendment. Councilor Julik. Discussion on the amendment. Councilor Julik. Um, as, as we're talking, I got thinking, are we looking for prepayment? Like I'm thinking if you register, that means you're registering and you're writing a check. Does that need to be in the motion? Uh, staff. Um, I think we can handle that from, from administrative side. Okay. I was thinking that, but I just thought I'd let you answer. Okay. okay. Any more discussion on the amendment? Councillor Hoffman. Not looking to be difficult, we're going to do it anyways. Yeah. Uh, do we want to put a cap at all? Like, if we get everybody going, do we just want to jump in? And if there's 400 households, do we want to put 40,000 into this? And I'm seeing nodding everywhere, so I guess I'll leave it at that, and we can. I guess I guess my comment there would be uh, maybe you're not wrong in regards to a cap, <clears throat> but a couple okay, a couple months ago, we had staff come up with a report in regards to uh, looking at. Uh, adding another uh, pickup for garbage on a weekly basis with alternate on the uh, recycle so that we'd be doing it. I believe this is a way for people to not put that yard or that waste into their garbage cans and maybe again it helps them out as well as a household. Councillor, go ahead Councillor Hoffman. I, I don't disagree with the concept. It's just more that we're by not having it and going with the registration we're saying essentially no limits and if we're... I, as I said, my wife's going to want one of these. We're doing it. I guess it's going to be that way, and that's fine. Uh, but that doesn't mean that it's a good idea to do 400 to start. But I, d I don't expect it to be. I'm not expecting that, but I'm just looking at it as a, as a way of doing things. Do we really want an open limit? And I am willing to defer to council on it. So um, I'm going to defer to staff and just get a, a staff opinion if we should maybe have a cap. I'll ask Ms. Finney again if she's been working on this project. Thank you, Ms. Finney. Oh, you turned yourself off. No, turn yourself off. Oh, did I? That's good. That's good. I'm a, don't touch anything. <laughs> I'm so excited being in the front. I don't know what to push. <laughs> Mayor and Council, um, first of all, thank you very much for, for all the support. I think the commentary that I've received from... Uh, staff and residents since they've seen this on the agenda has been overwhelmingly positive and they I had already anticipated a bit of a free-for-all for those 50 spots uh, and I think there may be a free-for-all for the 100 spots. Uh, I'm also mindful of the fact that it is a pilot and I think supply and demand here if we put a pilot limit of 200 in the first instance uh, to ensure that those that are going to be the most proactive and do the best they can with the unit will be in first. And if we get an overwhelming uh, response to the registration and we go up to 400 or 500, I think that would be perhaps phase two, even if it comes two or three months later. Um, that would just be my suggestion. You know, I think having it diluting it by having it no cap means that our um, impact may be less. Thank you for your comments. And, and my concern was trying to figure out a dollar value for budget. And knowing what we're, we're actually uh, approving, whether it's, you know, and Councillor Hoffman, you're the one that said it, right? 40,000, 60,000, like, you know, we, we also got to be mindful that we're actually doing a rebate um, from the municipality side as well. That's part of the pilot program, so. All right, well, we're still in discussion on this amendment. <laughs> Let's do this one first before we, if we're going to put a limit to it. Uh, Council Norbert. <clears throat> Thank you, Mayor Kalka. I, you know, I would defer to Ms. Finnegan's suggestion that maybe we should have a cap so we do have um, actuals in our budget so we know what we're going to um, be agreeing to. Um, so, yeah, I think I'll be voting against, even though we had some difficulties in making this amendment. You know, I think having a cap of 200 is reasonable, and that's where we should be, I think. Councillor Julik. <clears throat> Sorry, I was just going to, yeah, basically what Councillor Norbury said. I just didn't get my button shut off. So <clears throat> I understand we could defeat this and put a whole new motion on the floor, but um, that's what I would do. Defeat this, amend, defeat this amendment and put a new amendment on it. Yep. Just so we have a bunch. Okay. okay, call the question. All in favour? Opposed. <laughs> <laughs> Motion's defeated. <laughs> Councillor Norbury. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Kakaka. 
Um, I'll make an amendment to the motion to increase the number of households from 100 to 200. Seconder on that, Councillor and Oksana. Okay. My guess, my only comment is going to be that we should should be again ordered on the on, in regards to the pre-order list, not 200, but it's pre-order list plus 10 percent maximum of 200. The only reason I say that is, I mean, I don't want to see, uh, no disrespect to stop, I don't think it would happen, but go out and order 200 of these and we only go through 75. We have 125 sitting to the side. I know, I know the city of Dawson Creek um, did lots of draws on extra units that they had, so that would be my concern, so. Councillor Julick. Um, I would just like to get Ms. Finnegan's opinion if we did the plus 10%. So let's say we had 150 people come in and pay for them, and then we got an extra 15 units. Would that be, would that affect our pilot program result? Ms. Torval. Ms. Finnegan. Oh, don't touch. Mayor and Council, I would, uh, having spoken to the Food Cycler team several times before, everything would be pre registered and prepaid. We would pay and order and pay for those that have been paid for and, and registered for. So I think, again, that supply and demand. If you're interested, register, pay, and you'll get it. And then we're not sitting with stock and surplus floating around. So make it very black and white. Councillor Hoffman. Yeah, I totally agree. I don't think we need extras. This is round one of a pilot program. If there's high demand, three months from now we get our results and we justify it, maybe we really want them and we offer a higher rebate, maybe it's only worth $50 to us and we just think as a general thing, why don't we do this for the town and have a program? I, I just, pre-registration, up to 200, paid for, done. If it works, great. Let's talk about what else we want to do for policy and other future pilots. I just think, I think your point of up to 200 is bang on. Just how many people are willing to put down the 100 bucks, sorry, the 300, depending on what unit size they want, whatever the breakdown is, and we are on the hook for $100 plus shipping per unit, and then we know we're on the hook for 25, I don't know what the shipping rates is, but 25,000 or whatever it ends up being. I, I think that's the easiest thing to do. This is coming back up again. We're going to do it, we're gonna get results, and we're gonna talk about it again. So for today, up to 200, I think is, is the easiest thing to do. And remember, we're gonna talk about it in three months again. Okay, any more discussion? Okay, call the question all in favor. Opposed? Motion's carried. Okay, Tumblr Ridge Golf Course Restaurant 2023 Operations. Report dated April 3rd, 2023 from, from Facilities Manager regarding the Tumblr Ridge Golf Course Restaurant 2023 Operations. Recommendation, please. Councillor Julik. That Council directs administration to enter into a lease agreement with TR Mulligans as per the request for proposal closing March 24th, 2023, for the purpose of operating the Tumbler Ridge Golf Course Restaurant, and that Council approves the Golf Course Restaurant lease as presented. Seconder, Councillor Noberry. Discussion? Councillor Clickash? Yes, uh, Your Worship. Uh, I don't see anything about cleanup um, uh, in the, this uh, agreement. As far as if, if this person wants to leave the premises, are they going to have, be, have this place cleaned up, ready for the next person to come along? Because I know that we spent about fifteen thousand dollars cleaning up in in the past between operators because they just left a big mess, and that was. I think something should be in this contract. Uh, Ms. Torval. Uh, thank you. Uh, well, we have not in the recent years, we haven't had issues with uh, uh, vendors leaving, contractors leaving uh, mess behind. Uh, but I will ask Ms. Uh, McKay if she could speak to that. Yeah. I'm trying to see what number she's on. Much the security damage is what we're retaining. There you go. Sorry. Too many mics on. <laughs> there you go. Um, 
So in the agreement, we do retain a security deposit, which we would withhold if there was cleaning or extra damages uh, that we had to pay for. Um, as far as specific, uh, I think it's pretty much just an understanding that it's presented to them in one state and then they, they return it to us in that same state where we withhold their damage deposits. Councillor Julek. Um, I have a couple of questions. Um, so I, I, I see in here that there is the ability for the landlord to check for premises or to check the premises. So I guess um, to Councillor Click Ash's concern, uh, do we have a policy where we go in and check to make sure that the facilities are being taken care of? Um, and my second question is, as we extended the lease through the winter, um, does that not change our lease? Um, like when I look at the part, to, or part year leases and operating agreements versus the continuous, um, how are we managing that? Um, like, does it, because from what I can tell, and I may have misunderstood, but there's different um, different options for continuous leases and operating agreements versus the part year leases and operating agreements. So I'm just wondering if we, what we do when we have extended that lease. Ms. Torval. Uh, thank you, uh, Mayor and Council. So this lease currently, if Council approves this tonight, this will be the part year lease. Uh, what happened with the, the last last year, <laughs> uh, the operator had requested, uh, it was a part year lease, and uh, council had agreed to have her in there. On, they uh, approved the lease, sorry, for up till the end of December. And so we let her know that she could be approved for, for up until the end of December, and that was the that doesn't happen all the time. So she took a chance and was in there. And then while waiting for the RFP to come out at this time, uh, she was allowed to stay in and operate until this closed. Follow up. Uh, so then my question would be, should we not be looking at this as a full year lease or is that a concern? I guess maybe if, if they, uh, never mind. I guess they'll have to ask if they want it to be a full year lease. No, I think you're on the right comment because I was actually asking the same question because previously, last year's lease was kind of, to be honest, council was different because we actually had put it out, we uh, staff had gotten no no uh, applicants. We pretty much put it out again, like anybody, give us what they would do. Council would look at it on a one-off, one basis. We obviously, f staff had put it out, somebody had, had, had came in, council approved that one with it going back out. I always thought this the golf course lease previously to all COVID was a full year lease that they didn't have to come to extend after October. And it also was, I believe, a three year contract with a chance for renewal or two years with a chance for renewal or something. It was a longer concept contract pre COVID. It was just like um, we put all of our contracts the same Monkman RV park and the golf course and such. So I don't think you're, you're going down the wrong path, Councillor Julek, because that was my questions as well. Um, I'll go to Councillor Hoffman and, and then we'll go from there. Thank you, Mayor. I, I, this might just be an extension, but we have rent for the annual amount of 15500 5, 15, And then the next one, this is uh, Clause 5 on the second page, page 2 of 22. And then in Clause 6, we have equal monthly payments of 3100 And if I'm doing the math right, that's five months of the total term here. So is the monthly rate 3100 a month? Is that correct? Uh, Ms. Torval? Yes, that is correct. Okay. So are we, so do we need to change number five to reflect uh, 12 times 3100? So I guess just from clarity from staff side is it's up to the proponent if they want to continue after whatever date, if they want to close down in December, they just have to advise uh, staff, I believe it was. But, you know, I did read through a lot of this and I couldn't find a lot of that in there, but I agree with you. The only thing is, is, is the proponent might only want to stay till November. We didn't demand that they have to stay open 12 months a year. So <clears throat> the previous contracts we'd seen, and I didn't see it in here, was if they wanted to continue past October or whatever, they didn't need permission from council. They didn't need permission from staff. They just had to advise staff so staff could build them. Okay. But we can get clarity from, from, from staff on your question. Ms. Torval? 
Thank you, uh, Mayor. The proponent only wants to stay until October. Okay, can we word this differently then? Because I don't like seeing annual rent in the amount of, in that uh, suggestion. Are we allowed to have somebody else go in or use other facilities in there during the time they don't want to use it? Like, I understand it's annualized with five months. I mean, I get that. But when I read this, that's that's not what smacks me in the face. So, I mean, even if you wanted to remove the annualized amount, like, I... I all of a sudden interpret that a whole lot more if you don't have requirements. Uh, I, th I just, I think you need more specific clauses if you're gonna let them be off the hook for periods of times, whether or not we can use it or rent it during the times, whether they want the right to sublet it. I think we have to deal with all those things if you're gonna give a five month contract on a facility for that I would rather see used annually. Um, I don't have the answer, but I just the way that it's written right now, I'm concerned that we're agreeing to 15,500 for the year. They pay for five months and they go, oh yeah, I covered the year. And then they go and use it for seven more months. If that's dealt with elsewhere, I apologize. There's lots of interwoven clauses, but I just wanna make sure that that's not allowed. Ms. Torval. Thank you, Council. I believe we have a policy or uh, uh, we amended our bylaw, fees and charges bylaw, that if anyone was wanting to rent the golf course space uh, when it wasn't being used by um, a contractor or an operator, that they can do so. Okay. So it's not totally tied up. The facility isn't totally tied up when it's not in use, like it's still available. I understand they want to protect their right to be able to go back for the five month period next year. Yeah. I just, I think we, and yes, I get it. It's dense reading, but I think we, we need to do something with the, the annual rent rate, however it gets chopped up. But right now, I, I don't like the word annual and 15.5 together in the same clause. I think that could be interpreted as they have the right to have it for the full year and that they paid their five months and now the seven months is there to do with what they, they please. Uh, so that's my only concern that I've, uh, that I came across. Thank you, Councillor Hoffman. Councillor Noberry. Thank you, Mayor Kakalka. So firstly, to Councillor Hoffman's point, I think it's, it's a good, good, it's good comment, it's a good catch, mm -hmm. because you know, when, when the law is concerned, they're gonna see annual and 15,000 in the same sentence and say, oh, you guys made a mistake. So just, just if we can just move forward and, and adjust that. Um, I think you said a lot of what I wanted to say, like we give operators the option to end in October or the end of October because of the cyclical nature of the service industry and, and a lot of operators in the past have found it um, too, too cost prohibitive to operate in the December months. If they feel otherwise, they're welcome to extend and I'm happy to do that. But this time I, I would be hesitant to say you have to do the whole year they're asking for to the end of October and that's good practice. Yeah, and I agree, and I just know it was up to them. <clears throat> I guess my other concern would be, again, this is a year contract. Previously, we have a, a policy or something else that states it's for three. Um, so it states right in here it's till 20, you know, 2023, and then they can extend. But it's supposed to be a three-year contract with a chance of extension, with the opportunity to extend if, the district, if both parties agree, council and the proponent. Just like the Monk and RV Park, we decided to do that so people could make their investments, whether it's buying fire pits or, or, or such. And I'm just curious about that in here. It doesn't state for three years. With the option to renew? Yeah, it says that, but it was actually for three years with, with the option to extend. And I believe uh, the previous uh, council here in the previous couple of meetings, we sent it back out for, for an RFP in regards to Monkman RV Park, and that was more than a year contract. So the leases policy states that uh, they can have the... Uh Granted, the dirt is successful. They get the lease for a year with the option to renew for two years. One year plus an optional two years. Okay. Okay. Councilor Julik. Um, yeah, I'm comfortable with that. Um, I, I think um, if it comes back to look for an extension, I think that we need to make sure that we are clear that they're only extending the part year lease um, because otherwise I think it could be looked at that, oh, well, I was there for a full year, so it could be considered a continuous lease. That's just for housekeeping. Um, but I would like to make a motion uh, after, I would like to make a motion that number five be changed. The tenant must pay the landlord uh, the amount of 15.5 during the term. 
rather than have annual rent. Um, and then my only other concern. Hang on a second, hang on a second. Just put it oh, on okay. the floor. So, okay. Uh, seconder, Councillor Oxana, discussion on the motion. There is a motion on the floor. Oh, there is. Yeah. So you have to amend it. Sorry. Okay. So I would like to amend the current motion on the floor. Um, oh, before I do that, there's another question I have before I make an amendment. Okay. Okay. So in the number four, it says permitted early uh, termination. The the last line I'm a little concerned about, and it might just be because it's lease language. You know that stuff that regular folks don't necessarily know, but it says the tenant may terminate this lease on 90 days written notice without payment of damages or other compensation to the landlord. Like I I don't really know what that means and I'm not super comfortable that if that means if they damage it that they don't have to pay us. Like I know that they have the $3,100 damage deposit. But Ms. Torval? Yeah, that's for if, uh, if they decide or if, you know, they decide that their business is not going well and they wish to terminate. And we've had that happen before where an operator is, well, it was pre, just as COVID was coming on there, there was an operator and uh, they decided that they wanted to, to cancel and not go, go forward. So. Okay, Councillor Hoffman. Council for councils and council approved it. Councillor Hoffman. Councillor Julie was asking for a follow-up. Councillor Hoffman. Okay. Um, it's actually related to yours as well. Um, I read it the same way that it's for damages for early termination and when we have a five month contract in 90 days notice, I'm not gonna worry about it in, in this particular context. So yes, but I think they're gonna try for 60 days before they'll try to cancel anyways. Councillor. So I'm just clarifying, uh, my mind went to physical damages. This just means monetary damages. All right, yeah, I'm comfortable with that. So I would like to make a motion, or I'd like to amend the motion from that council approves the golf course restaurant lease as presented to as amended, um, just to changing number five there. I haven't made any amendments, so. Uh, I mean, I, I actually have some changes to oh, okay. discussion. So I actually think what we do is call the call the question on this on this uh, first motion and turn it down, and then we make this, the changes. So there's a change in regards to the rent of the fifteen five, and then bring it back. Uh, that's what I would suggest. So um, I'll call the question on the motion. All in favor? Opposed? Motion is defeated. It's just then we don't have to do a bunch of amendments. So you go ahead and do your amendment in regards to five if you want. Um, I would like to move that council approves the golf course restaurant lease with the amendment of. No, no, hang on a second. Just make your amendment on five, whatever you want to change on five. Okay, I would like to change number five in the lease uh, to say the tenant must pay the landlord rent in the amount of 15.5 during the term. Okay, seconder. Councillor Hoffman, discussion. So I guess my only comment back to staff would be we need that there because I, I, my concern is what happens if she extends for November, December, January. That just changes that number. But the term of this lease is only that amount. She'd have to sign a new lease. But there's no term stated in that part of the rent. Then we could add six months or whatever. I, like I'm not a lawyer and, and no, no bad. If, if, if staff thinks that that's, that's fits, I'm good with it. I guess just from staff side is... As, as, as long as that change that the, the council judge has just put on the floor, it meets what we need, and then I'm fine with it. I just want to make sure we're protected. Um, Mayor and Council, under number two, under the term, it says the term may be extended by mutual agreement of the district and the tenant, provided uh, during the term all conditions of this agreement shall remain in full force and effect unless otherwise mutually agreed on, upon. And uh, yeah, the lessee, the lessee is in good standing in regards to the terms of any previous leases for consideration of an extension. And I think okay. it'll be fine. Okay, good enough for me. Okay, any more? Oh, sorry, Council Nobert. Oh, trying to turn myself off. Sorry. Okay, any more discussion? If we can just read the motion back, please, Ms. Storble. That we remove, uh, under number five, that we remove the word annual. Okay, thank you. Call the question. All in favor? Carried. So before I put a motion on the floor, I, uh, just from staff side, because I, I don't understand um, 
in regards to why I understand why we put in the contract, but I don't always agree with it. And, and if it needs to be there, I'm fine with it. But stating what hours of operation a proponent needs to be open. Again, I think they know their business. And when we dictate that they have to be open certain times, um, we see staff constraints within Tumbler Ridge as well. Mm -hmm. uh, to me, when we put that in there, we're, we're, we're expecting, not expecting it has to be open. If there's no staff, why do we even have that? To me, I think they should be able to set the hours of operation based on, if it's pouring with rain, I believe the District of Thumb Ridge shuts down the pro shop. I mean, to me, when we set hours, if it's pouring rain, th these individuals would have to stay open no matter what, 10 o'clock in the morning, 12 o'clock. That would be my concern. I mean, they rely on golfers as well, as not just regular uh, tourists and stuff coming down. But I, I, that's I just from staff side, I'm just curious what your thoughts are there. That is a, a valid point, uh, Council. Uh, but I do know that in in previous years, uh, there there has been some uh, questions about hours of operation at the golf course. Uh, there were people that were going there, and the golf course was closed. And so then it was, uh, I think, a direction of council that when we did put out that there would be set hours, so that there would be uh, consistency, and that the public would know when when they could go there or or when they were closed. Okay, Council Julik. Um, I understand uh, Mayor Kakauka's concern, um, and. My like where I go with that is like so if 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 we don't have something in there, my concern is, is that then that operator could decide they're not going to be open for a weekend or something like that. So I understand that. I also understand to have specific hours is challenging because of staff or because of a golf tournament or whatever. Um, so I don't know how we would uh, necessarily solve that problem unless we had they must be open daily and less of inclement weather or something possibly. I don't know what that looks like, um, but I like that to me is a bit of a possibility. I agree. I don't know that I like the specific hours on there. Councillor Hoffman. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I think the answer is we don't renew their lease if we don't like how they're operating. Uh, this is... I'm glad you brought it out. I didn't even register it, but this is horribly burdensome for a business. Like it really is that you get an outbreak of fever or something and have somebody say, hey, you're breaking your lease and having to deal with it. Um, to my mind, if we expect a certain rental payment, which we do, we don't have any agreement for a percentage of sales. There is no benefit to us for them to operate more. Uh, I would be in favor of removing this clause just outright. Yeah, you know, and I brought it up for discussion more before I put a motion on the floor. Just listening to staff, and and, and I read it, and and I just wanted to put it out there. Maybe it's it's worth leaving it. I just wanted to get that the, the thought process. And I mean, they they can send a letter of written permission and be received by the district on a Saturday afternoon. I don't know, but I mean, I mean, right now, I mean, I've been down there. Their proponents, you know, they've worked as hard as they can and stuff. And I think persons has got to, you know, trust the. The contract and the staff time and, and, and that that we put into it. I don't know. Council Norbury. Thank you, America Cuck. I'm, I'm not a golfer, I'll be honest. But I, I want to think like this clause is in there because some people have an expectation of being able to go to a golf course, have lunch, have dinner around those times. It's kind of a, I believe from, from my last term, like that's an expectation that people do have. So if we're wanting to lease out this um, space, we'd still want to accommodate people's expectations and having a lunch service or a dinner service after they have their rounds. I mean, I understand everyone's comments about, um, you know, why would we limit businesses? But I mean, we are, we are looking at what services we want provided in our community. And do we want to make sure that people can go have around a golf, have lunch? Yeah, I can see it. I see why it's there. Again, I'm not married to it. No, good comments. Councillor Julik and then Councillor Hoffman. I'm prepared to make a motion that uh, number 14 is removed from uh, this policy as well. Seconder. Councillor Hoffman. Discussion. Um, sorry, I, I'm on. I was just. Councillor Hoffman. I just wanted to answer Councillor Norbury, and I, I actually don't disagree with the concept but I do disagree with putting it in a written lease. I think the answer to that is talking to the owners and going, hey, we're here in that lots of golfers on Sunday afternoon at three o'clock in that range that you just haven't been open the last few weeks. 
is there something going on? And if it comes back to us when we're renewing, then we can discuss it and say their their operations aren't there. But to put it in writing and call it a lease, I think, is is a step too far for me. Councillor Julek? Um, I think uh, as a business owner, um, I feel that this is over, overstepping uh, by council. I appreciate Mayor Kakauka recognizing it. I, I, it was something I just read over and, and didn't even click to put my mindset there as, as the person running the business. Um, I understand where uh, Councillor Norbury comes from as well. I would hope that um, this business recognizes the the benefit of, of having be open. Like I know some of the complaints are there's, there's lots of complaints, but you're going to get lots of complaints about businesses. I'm quite sure Mayor Krakowka gets a few his way as well, any kind of business. So um, I, I agree with Councillor Hoffman and Mayor Krakowka. I, th I think that this is um, unnecessarily, um, I can't think of the word, but I, I, I just don't think it's necessary. I, I think we're overstepping by trying to tell a business how they should operate. We've, we've said we want it for a certain time period. That's it. If, if, if they suck as business people, that's not really our part. And I also appreciated um, Councillor Hoffman saying if, if we aren't happy with the lease, we do have the ability to, to cancel their lease and ask them to leave. Councillor Norbury. Thank you, Mayor Kakaka. So this is our space, right? Like we're not saying what a business has or have to do. Like we, we do have the ability to say, hey guys, this is the service we want in our community. Uh, people that are using our golf course um, want to have lunch. They want to have dinner. We would like, if you want to do, if you'd like to enter into business with us, this is, these are the terms that we'd like to see. So we're not restricting a business. Like they are coming to the table. They know what they're being, they know what's expected of them. Um, yeah, I understand what you're saying, Liv, but that would be if we went into a business and said, you need to change your hours to fit this. This is up front. This is already there. Um, before they sign the lease. So I think that's a little um, incorrect when we say we're um, telling a business how they ought to operate. We're saying this is our space. This is what we want to serve our community. You know, yeah, I, mean, I just think about the golfers here, guys. Like, people, people are per they, lo they love that place down there, and they do want to have food down there. Um, we, went to, we bent over backwards the last um, term to get somebody down there, and thankfully, uh, Chantel... Um, stepped up and took care of that for us. Um, yeah, I mean, do, do, do our residents want to have dinner down, uh, lunch down there as well? Maybe, maybe. So I'm just, I think, I don't know, still on the fence. Yeah, I appreciate comments, Councilor Norbury and Councilor, Councilor Hoffman. And, you know, maybe I opened up something here, but <clears throat> I don't think it's bad. Maybe, I, you know, maybe I misread or read more into it. Um, I guess just Morris was looking for clarity from staff. I got it. And then... Uh, um, give me the debate and everything else. Going to go to staff and then Councillor Julik. Thank you. Just so Council is aware, these hours that are in this lease are the hours that she provided, the minimum hours that she would be operating. So those are her hours. We don't, we're not dictating that she uh, be open those hours, but because she submitted those hours of operation to us, we included them in, in the lease agreement. Thank you. Councillor Julik. Um, it makes me feel better to hear that those are the hours she put in there. I guess for me, though, to, to keep something standing for those hours, I just think that businesses, business itself changes and flows, um, whether it's due to your staffing, whether it's due to when you see the, the hours are busier. So currently they put 12 to 2 and then they realize, oh, shoot, you know, I've got people standing outside for lunch from 10, like maybe I need to do 10. And I know they can do more, but then they see, you know what I mean? Like I, I just would hate to lock them into specific hours. Hours. I'm fine to say um, daily without a reasonable reason. Like I, I'm willing to leave that. But even that to me, then we're getting nitpicky and we're trying to micromanage that lease holder. So I'm still content to uh, vote in favor of having uh, number 14 removed um, and hope that they recognize the importance of that. I just, I just think the hours, because I, and I hear what you're saying, Councillor Norbury, because I've had those complaints come back to me about, I can't even get a sandwich when I go on the course, or um, the beer cart didn't come at all today, you know. And I know that th those are some expectations that are there. Um, I think though that we can let the people at the uh, that run the operation take those complaints that it it doesn't come to us, so that when they phone. Uh, town hall to complain. We say you need to contact the provider of those services, um, and and I think 
um, to your point as well. I feel like if we have something that we run want run in a specific way, then maybe we should be the ones running it. So, so just for clarity, these are the minimum hours of operation. They can change the hours to earlier or later. Just read it there. Councillor Hoffman? I, I appreciate that this business owner put down those hours, but uh, to hold to somebody this for five months and say that you have to be open and if you close at 1.30 on a day, you're in violation of your lease, I, I find ridiculous. Uh, I just, going forward, when we're looking at leases, it's one thing to tell a business what hours to operate. I'm assuming she's in it to make money. She'll figure out her hours and she'll do what she can. And I want her to have the flexibility to say, you know what, everybody's out with COVID-23. Like it, that's just something that could happen. And I don't want this coming back because some golfer's mad that they didn't get a sandwich that day. I'm sorry, stuff happens. Uh, the only exception I would have for hours in a future lease is if we're talking about a society which we're granting funding to, to maintain hours. If we were, Take the uh, youth center, for example, that they decide that they're going to be open from 1 to 3, Monday to Friday. I have a problem with it. Maybe not this year since they're not taking money, but the, just conceptually, that space is having a non-business purpose. And uh, again, I appreciate that this is the plan, but I don't think the plan belongs in a lease. It's, it's just not a good idea. And anytime. Thank you, Mayor Krakowka, for pointing it out because I did slip by it when I first looked at it. I don't think any business should be held to specific hours unless there's a very compelling reason and a restaurant doesn't have a compelling reason to be open at this particular hour on any given day. Thank you. New information? Okay, good. I'm going to call the question. Uh, the motion on the floor is to remove 14 and that's the hours of operation in the contract. Call the motion all in favour. Opposed. Motion is defeated. <clears throat> All right. Uh, I can take the motion to approve the golf course lease as amended. If somebody wants to make it, Council Norbury. Thank you, Mayor Kakalka. That council directs administration to enter into a lease agreement with Tier Mulligans as per request for proposal closing March 24th, 2023, for the purpose of operation of the Tumble Ridge Golf Course Restaurant and that council approves the golf course restaurant lease as amended. Seconder. Councillor Julik, discussion. Okay, call the question, all in favor. Carried. Okay, Growing Communities Fund report dated April 3rd, 2023 from the intern CEO and director of corporate services regarding Growing Communities Fund, recommendation. Councilor Norbury. <laughs> Sorry, I just had you for, on. For I don't want to discuss, I don't need to discuss okay. it. So. Anybody want to discuss it? Councilor Knox -Sana. Does discussing it mean we're talking about what we'd like to spend this money on or what this money could be spent on? Uh, yep, so you'd have to bring it up for discussion. So the councilor, or the councilor receives the Growing Community Fund report for discussion. Seconder. Councilor Gielek, all in favor? Sure. Councillor Noxena. So this is a cool grant, but what are we going to, like, is there a plan for what we're going to spend it on? Where does the money go? So there is certain criteria that it, where it has to be spent. Um, it's within the letter that where, where the funds can be used in regards to this grant. Um, so like my, my thought there, and I mean, it's up to council, but you know, setting about to, to, to staff to come forward with ideas. I mean, there, it doesn't have to be spent right away, but it definitely has to be managed by staff, uh, finance department, whatever, staff. Um, again, not my department to tell you what department to use uh, and keep it updated. Um, so, uh, Ms. Torville? That is correct. And as we, uh, of course, we just recently received this grant and uh, we're quite excited to get this, so uh, there's certain criteria that has to be met. It's got to be put in a, at a fund, and, and according to the criteria as well, there has to be a bylaw created for it, and um, rigid reporting and everything else. So we will uh, uh, bring back a report to council and keep you up to date and request input, of course, as we um, go along with this. Councillor Julik. Um, so the same as we get the, the budgeting money that we council 
puts in like we do through the budget process. Um, I know, oh, December 31st, I was looking through the other pieces that we have to allocate the funds by December 31st. So, um, and then that point, will you be reaching out to council or will it just be staff putting forward um, initiatives that they would like to see move forward? Sorry. Ms. Torvald, don't be sorry. sorry. Thank you, uh, council. Um, no, any initiatives that come forward will definitely uh, have to be blessed by council. And council may even have your own initiative, you know, knowing that we have this grant. So it's both ways. Thank you. Councilor Norbert. Oops. Thank you, Mayor Kakaka. So, you know, to Councilor Noxana's comments, we, we've had them, we've sort of handled a grant like this previously with, with um, we got COVID relief funding because we, we lost revenue. And like the way that worked is we got this pot of money and staff util, uh, try, it's made suggestions on where to allocate that. It did come back to council. So I'm, I'm, I think this would be something very similar to that. Um, it's not free money for, for staff to go run with, but it, it is brought back to us. We do get to see and, and, and have um, input on it. And it's uh, very clear and transparent. And the keep a running tally, it was, you know, I'm, I think it's great. Yeah, and does staff need a motion? You're planning on coming back anyways with the bylaws and all that? So I mean, there's there is a list on page 126 of our agenda. That's some of the some of the ideas of where this money can be spent. <clears throat> there is other uh, there is other places that if you go through their site, there's it adds up more and more um, other other things. So um, I'm glad staff was able to get this out in front of council. Um, I was away and received a phone call right from the ministry um, just as the grant was being allocated, and uh, I asked the gentleman to go back and get us a bit more of the pot, but. Uh, I told him I'd see him in Victoria and we'll talk about it. So, but yeah, it's great to see. So look forward to staff bringing it back. Uh, schedules of meeting. Schedules of meetings. Council. Council Julek. Oh, hang on one second. Council Julek, just hit your button again. Uh, Ms. Torval. Yes, thank you. Um, we need to, uh, we're requesting that council schedule a special budget meeting for April 24th. And in addition, we would like council to cancel the May 8th regular council meeting and move it to, uh, and reschedule it for May 1st, or just cancel the, the May 8th and have a meeting on May 1st, May 1st instead. May 8th um, is the week of the NCLGA convention as well, so. If we could move. Okay, is there a reason why we're counseling May or our staff's asking for May to be counseled? Because NCLJ actually starts on the on the ninth. There's one there's one thing for the for the eighth. I mean I'm not sure how many council's going to it. I know myself I'm not attending. Two of you are going? I was actually planning on just saying I'm Talking to, to uh, Miss Curry, that uh, I'll I'll drive on the Monday for whoever wants to to go, or Sunday night, whatever we decide. And whether it's two or three of us, we'll be at the conference. First time council seemed like a reasonable thing to go to the first day. Okay, good enough. Okay, so does May first work for council? Council Julie, sorry, I can't put your mic on in a second. Got a council one to put you on. There you go. Um, yeah, I, I'm glad that uh, Ms. Torville's talked about that. I was concerned that I hadn't seen another budget meeting. Um, and then to have the, um, I'm happy to have it moved to May 1st, um, just so that I, I had hoped to be at the Northern Health uh, thing at the NCLGA for the whole day. Like it, it's scheduled for 8 to 4.30. And so that'd be a bit of a cruise to get back to a hotel to come in by Zoom, so. May 1st work for council. May 1st work for staff. 5 p.m. Yes. Um, there is budget and get on the 17th, is there not? We talked about that at a previous thing, so there's budget on the 17th as well? Yes. Okay. So budget on the 17th and adding a, a meeting for the 24th. Now I may not be here, just so council's aware. April, um, Luana, just so you're aware, I may, I may not be in town. Get ready. 17th of April. 
April? Well, the 17th of April is one of the budget meetings that was uh, talked about at the last budget meeting, and then we're looking at adding um, May or April 24th. That's good with council, April 24th. Okay. Anything else, Council Julik? Um, I was wondering the culture will cultural awareness i'm wondering if we can't proceed with that until our budget talk to have something like that scheduled okay yeah it's gonna wait for a budget to be approved before they can spend anything yeah. five five o'clock yep yeah. okay anything in regards to schedule meetings from council anything else uh just so council's aware uh, Councillor Dussault, um, Kofi is the 12th, 13th, and 14th. Councillor Forrest and Mr. Okay. Notice of motion. Councillor Julik. Um, I know that uh, you had already talked about the the council remuneration policy coming back. Yep. Um, I would just like to make that notice of motion. No motion needed. Okay. It's coming out on a PMP. No I motion. just would, okay. As long as it comes sooner rather than later. <laughs> coming on a PMP. When, staff will get it in front of us when, we, when they can. When there's changes made, staff automatically bring it. It's already on the board in your office. That's why I say no, no notice okay. of motion needed. Okay. Anything else? No. Any other notice of motion from council? Okay, councilor business. Council Norbury. Thank you, Mayor Kakalka. Uh, I've already said it in previous meetings, but tomorrow is the uh, ECE child care open house from uh, two till three. So if you do have people interested that are, may uh, want to investigate and uh, change in their um, trade, you know, they can come out, get some information. There's a lot of um, incentives and initiatives that the government are trying to push. And um, we'll have Northern Lights College there to tell you about how you can get educated. Um, so hopefully some people, I've already tried to do what I can to invite people, but any more would be great. And uh, the, the other thing is, I hope people can get out to the Easter event um, this Saturday at TRE. They, you're welcome to throw a pie at my face and I uh, hope it'll be well attended, so. Thanks. Thanks, Council Member. Council Julek. Um, we had a Tumblr Reach Health Needs Task Force meeting on Friday, um, but because it was on Friday, we I didn't get into this um, agenda. I uh, I think I'll just get uh, Miss Curry to add the minutes to our next agenda, as Mayor Kakauka has here. But I did want to bring up a couple of items within the task force, um, there was a PCN steering committee was formed and a terms of reference was developed. We do not have a member of our council to sit on that um, committee and um, Ms. DeMaio actually asked us specifically for that. Their meetings, they, it was formed about eight months ago um, and uh, each municipality can participate participate in the steering committee and the invitation was sent to the district of Tumblr Ridge for a representative to sit on this committee. It could be mayor or the alternate. Um, the purpose of the steering committee is the decision maker and they are held virtually. And uh, the last one was held on February 13th, I believe. And there's, there's also another committee with it. So then from that, we also have the, um, Oh, I wrote it down and I don't know what the heck I did with my notes. Oh, here it is. Okay. Um, there's also a primary care network steering committee and, or that's that one. And then there was another one, uh, the Tumblr Ridge community table on primary care. And that meeting was on February 24th. So of this, there's three task force or three committees within this healthcare thing. So if we can um, get, if Mayor Kerkauka could appoint somebody in an alternate for the steering committee, that would be great. Um, and then also I think to get some clarity on if Councillor Clickash and myself are the ones who need to sit on the Tumblr Ridge community table. Um, Cause I know Mayor Kerkauka can jump in on any of those committees if he so desires. Um, just, just on a thought, is that not your subcommittee to the health task force? Or is that a total different one now? It's a total different one. 
So there's three, so there's the Tumbler Ridge Health Needs Task Force. Yep. There's the Tumbler Ridge Community Table on Primary Care. So that first meeting was February 24th that okay, I was. So that's your sub, that's the subcommittee okay. to the Health Task Force. Okay, so then that would be myself and, and Mr. Clickash, or Councillor Clickash then, okay. And then we need somebody to be appointed to the steering committee, the Primary Care Network Steering Committee. Okay. And I do have terms of reference for that. Um, so, and I'm happy to, to have that extend from, from my seat on the Tumblr Ridge Health Needs Task Force, but I understand that that needs to be an appointment that you make, or that would be my, my assumption. Um, the other thing in this that was interesting um, that uh, Dr. Pakalek had brought forward and uh, is that she asked if we have a locum or nursing house that could be available to the doctors and nurses coming into our, commu our community and, and Ms. Torville confirmed that, that we did. Um, she asked if this committee or if this condominium allowed pets as this could deter nurses and doctors from choosing Tumblr Ridge as they have no one to look after their pets. So um, I'm not sure, I, I talked to Ms. Torville and I just am never sure of the protocol of, do I have to bring it back to council to get staff to look at it or as they're sitting in on the meeting, can they just look into it as we ask within that meeting? Ms. Torville? So I know you have, a, um, you have the executive assistant um, at the task force. Um, I would think you can lean on them for that, for those, but I'm not sure if the strata allows pets. That's at, something uh, we would need to look into. And we, it's on our list and we just haven't gotten to it yet. So <clears throat> to me, in regards to the health task force, even the, the child's task force, we have the executive assistant that sits on those two committees um, to take notes. Now, I think until you feel it out, you can always pass it through the CAO to say, listen, these are the things we were looking for, can we? And then you'll, then you'll, to me, the, the task force chairs will, or co-chairs will, will see what, you know, what can go there and what has come here. Uh, I mean, that, that's um, why the position is there. That's my thoughts anyways, Councilor Julik. Okay. Um, and so it was a really good meeting. I really appreciated it. It had lots of information and, and uh, unfortunately it was the first one I was able to attend in, in, in person. So it was really cool. Um, the other thing I wanted to talk about in Councillor's business, and I know that we've kind of drawn a line and so I'm wondering maybe I should have brought this up, notion of motion, notice of motion, but I did have somebody approach me about delegations and that they had to provide their personal information on the form. Um, not understanding that that was going to be public. Now I read in the, um, I read in our agenda here that it says that. I just wonder if we can, um, like, so I see that Ms. Moy used Northern BC Tourism's information, but when we have um, volunteers putting their personal information, that's kind of a concern for me. And I wonder if maybe we can look at, at adjusting that policy or whatever that needs to look like. I think that, putting their personal information like where they live and stuff is is asking a bit too much for <laughs> it's one thing when it's a business because everybody knows where the business is um, so and then my other concern as we talk about things being um, shared publicly when we have the RFP data or expression of info of expression of interest information I'm concerned that those are going out in our public agendas as well um, I don't know that it keeps the process uh, fair and equitable if we put out the information for like I, I don't have a problem with the final number being there like at the end of the year the report that this is what it costs for that organization to run the golf course or whatever like I don't have a problem with the net coming out my concern is is so for TR Day Society when their information came out about what they ran the RV part for if we go out again and ask for another RFP somebody else already has that information of what somebody's running it for so I think it it um it makes it so that maybe somebody doesn't come in lower, the possibility of somebody wanting to do it lower, which isn't necessarily the, the case. But then they've, they've done the work to put that stuff together and then for them to have that, that out publicly, I just, I don't think that's fair and equitable. So I would, I would like to know if there's a policy or bylaw around that and if there is or there isn't that we look further into it. Ms. Torval? There isn't a, sorry, council. There isn't a bylaw or a policy that I'm aware of, but it's definitely something we can look uh, look into further. Okay. Uh, da, 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 da. Put a motion on the floor. 
for a report or whatever. I don't think they should do direction. Um, notice of motion. Um, we can go back to that notice of motion part. And if we want, yeah, if we want to do that notice of motion, that way council has a chance to ask you. Go ahead. Sorry. No problem. You'd think we'd figure out these buttons. I would like to motion that staff come back to us with information in regards to um, the RFP and EOI data being published publicly within our agendas. Just let them, let them get that one and then make sure they got it. You can hand those motions to them, right? Okay. Council, do you look prepared to hand in their motions on paper as well? I didn't write it down yet, but I'm sure I'll confirm with you. <laughs> and you have a second one? Um, that um, we look into the policy around delegations uh, having to fill out their personal information on the forms to come to council. Yep. Uh, any more councillor business? Okay, so I had a, a busy uh, bit of time there. Uh, I met with uh, Kelly Lake Metis, Metis, Metis Settlement Society. Uh, I met with them in Dawson Creek. Um, just to meet and greet. Um, I met with their president of this society. Um, just went over a few things and I've got clarity in regards to the Kelly Lake Community Hall. They do use it uh, when they need to and such. There was um, some concern maybe that they weren't all having the opportunity to use it. Uh, there's some talk in there in regards to that they are looking, um, now whether they're working with the government or they're just um, working within the, their, their own group of looking at taking on um, an area on the Forest Service Road. Um, talks about they're looking at trying to build a, a tourism thing in, in regards to that. Um, they talk about funding coming out of uh, um, the pipeline money. So uh, ecotourism, um, they talk about, you know, looking for partners and stuff. Um, so it could be more information coming from uh, that group at a later time. Um, apologize to Council so I called a meeting fairly short notice with the museum um, and that was just in regards to um, reaching out to different ministers in regards to minister meetings and one was the Minister of Tourism and I was just looking for some clarity back from the museum if um, tourism minister was able to meet if they would be able to uh, attend a, a meeting there uh, whoever the board was to decide whether it's their executive director or somebody from the board. Um, looks like there's there's a way to, for them to do it. Um, once I hear more, I might have to bring back uh, to council to see if we can cover flights and hotels. Um, the idea of that one came up from their uh, open house and, and tour and meet and greet with the Geopark at the museum. And one of it was uh, Collection BC reaching out to our museum in regards to wanting to house uh, fossils from Stewart and other communities. Um, I think this is an opportunity to try and see if we can um, leverage some funding from the provincial government. Uh, one thing that came out of the meeting, uh, Zena was gonna reach out to Collections BC to see if they would attend the meeting. They want to attend the meeting. So I think that is even better news. So um, we'll go from there. I had a great meeting with uh, West Moberly First Nations. Uh, myself and the executive assistant went down. Um, I'll be honest, I expected to possibly be there in an hour. We were there for about two and a half hours um, with uh, West Mo, with the chief and council. Some great things came out of there. Um, they're obviously having West Mo days in 2023. Council is, they're not doing, um, direct invitations, it's an open invitation for staff, council, residents um, to please partake and come out to West Mo Days. It's last weekend in July. Uh, when they talked about it, they talked about sponsorships and that from other organizations they deal with, obviously, some of the industries. And I did ask if there's anything that the District of Tumber Ridge could do. Um, uh, Dale Bumstead was there as he uh, works with West Mo and some of the other Soto uh, nations. And one thing they mentioned was a trailer from our geopark. So I did, again, I apologize to Councillor Hoffman, an emergency meeting with, with the uh, Geopark, just to get that out in front of them um, to make sure uh, before it came to this meeting tonight that they were aware of it. And it sounds like they will try their best to be there with the trader. Again, we may need to help. Um, and I told her to reach out through uh, Councillor Hoffman. 
if uh, possible, we maybe have to see if we can um, put a motion on the floor to direct staff to assist with uh, the transportation cost uh, using our truck or, or manpower. But again, that's something that to me Westmo was asking, and I think if we can partner up like that, I think it, you know it shows us that we're good community partners with our First Nation, uh, West with Westmo, really, and obviously I'll be meeting with Soto this week and McLeod Lake. I can't remember the date, but that is coming up as well. One thing we did talk about was caribou, and they talk about um, the penning. It's going over uh, really well from their side. They 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 see it. There's there's talk about a leadership table being put together. So with the mayors of the of uh, the, the Peace River, um, putting a leadership table together with the mayors and um, chiefs from from the nations, and they talk about taking us and actually showing us the penning project and stuff, which was was kind of surprising to me. Uh, previous years when I've met with, with Westmo and them, they were not in favor of pretty much anybody going out to the penning project. Pretty isolated, wanted to keep it, people away, but they actually want to get have people aware of, of what they're doing and why they're doing it. Um, so I think it's uh, you know something I look forward to to see if uh, if it does come to fruition. But the other thing that I reached out to and commented in regards to caribou was the picking of liking. Um, again, when they when they do uh, the picking of liking in our area, I did. I uh, mentioned to him to reach out. We could get some advertising out to see if any of our residents, council, staff would like to go out and assist in regards to um, picking the liking and why they're picking it and what they do with it, you know, that, that being aware. <clears throat> and there's um, there's talk again, which kind of surprised me, of of trying to get more people involved in seeing this pending project, seeing what it's about and why they're doing it. So it was kind of, it, it, was, it was totally different four years ago. So I think they're realizing that, it's, it's a success, but people don't realize why they're doing it and why you're out in the back country and you're seeing all these caribous with collars on them. And then the other thing he brought up in regards to caribou was um, talking to communities in regards to adopting a herd. Um, it's in the report about it. Um, you know, obviously, Tumble Ridge is in the prime area of adopt a herb, herd. Um, I think that's something maybe, I'm not sure what council thinks, but maybe we should look into that more and see what West Mo is, is looking for or the concept of it. I don't know what it means. Uh, it was pretty, like I said, a pretty open discussion. Um, but again, I think a lot of it is is the the learning and the educating of our residents, our, our tourists in regards to our sledders and, and stuff. It's not about closing down areas. I mean, they've obviously um, have done some closures in the area for, for, for reasons of high altitude or low altitude in regards to the caribou habitat. So I think it's worth looking into more to see what adopt the herd means. Um, but they're talking about in, involving Doss Creek adopting a herd, uh, Hudson Hope, like all the communities. They're finding that they can they can do the one penning project, um, but it really takes a lot of their time. Now, I'm not sure if they're talking about doing another penning project. That was a discussion in the previous council. I know there was some talk about a, another penning project in regards to Quintet Herd. I don't know if that's what they're talking about. Um, so I'd have to wait to see, but just thought I'd throw that out for council. Um, they also talked in regards to um, sponsorships, and not us sponsoring them, but you know when we have an organ organization in town doing so something, whether it's the TRDs ho hosting the fall fair or the museum or the geopark doing something, or you know Grizzfest does come back in 2024 and such, to, to reach out to them. It's never guaranteed, but they they are they are definitely. Uh, community partners and, and are definitely interested if they can sponsor something they would be definitely willing to do that. Um, they talked about in regards to their um, business out in the heavy industrial um, area with uh, with partnerships so they talk about how well it's going and they're looking at it's expanding it. Um, just don't want to miss anything here. I mean I know it's in the agenda so people can see it and council that's in the book but um, I'm not sure who can make it in regards to uh, West Mo Days, but there's these hand games. I'm not sure if anybody's ever heard of it, um, but it's an $8,000 prize up for grabs for the for the winners. And I heard it. Uh, I didn't know what it was, so I had to ask. But it's it's quite interesting. Sounds quite interesting. If you can gamble and and keep a straight face, you could be a winner. Um, so that's it for them. And then again, I apologize to Councillor Hoffman, but I have a, 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 uh, again, a meeting with, with uh, the UNESCO Global Geopark, uh, just quickly in regards to the trailer, uh, just because I knew it was going to be in the agenda tonight. And the other thing I wanted to inform the Geopark was in regards to reaching out to the museum about joining 
uh, in Victoria if we can get a meeting with tourism minister. And I just wanted them to understand that I was not picking one group over another, but this may be an opportunity, probably the first time in 42 years, I think Tumblr is, yes. I could be wrong on the date, um, that we would actually see, may possibly see some funding from the provincial government. And I think this is a, a step in, especially with collections management BC, reaching out to our museum. So. Um, for staff, in regards to Let's Talk, BC Amos has confirmed with me tonight that they will be able to attend Let's Talk. I know we were waiting for that, but they have just confirmed that they will be in attendance, as well as Northern Health is my understanding. And then we have um, the food thing on there. Is anything else from Council for Let's Talk? Council Joy. I was just hoping that um, at the Let's Talk with the food thing that we will be able to accept funds if somebody wants to sign up that night for the registration, that they'll be able to do that that night if we get started that night. I would think it'd have to be a tunnel in regards to the debit machine. We don't have portable, so instead of it being done at the community center, it's totally different finance department, but that's up to staff. I mean, they can definitely fill it out and come in and pay for it. But. Okay, I, yeah, I just thought they did have some portable ones. I just know from the, when I was at the RV park, there was a portable one, but that was many, many years ago. So not many, many, but many. <laughs> um, and then I just also wanted to note on the last page there, you had um, the geo, uh, that Amanda, Miss Meggs had a question in regards to that lease coming due in 2024 and didn't know if, if you missed it that, to send it off to staff. Kate, I just didn't know if you had to do it in an open meeting. No, it's executive assistant took it to um, from there. Um, I believe she had a meeting with her CAO. So that's what the direction was in the meeting. Anyways, some something like that again, right? Said to Miss Torval, this is what come out is okay. You know, Karen will bring it to you. Yeah, done. So because I mean, it is staff that'll work with them and then bring it, have it in front of council. Okay. Any questions in regards to the meetings I attended or any other information? Okay. Question and answer period. Ms. Torval. I was just questions. Okay, take adjournment. Councilor Norbury, seconder. Councilor Clickash, all in favor?